It's a proven fact during high intensity interrogation that when we say things like I did not instead of I didn't, that it follows a lie. Okay? There are so many things I can point out about what you're doing that are wrong and that, and that science backs up. Dude, there's something more here. I don't care. You can sit there all day long and talk to me. But I do this for a living and I risk my life and I have for 25 years. I've sat across from murderous bastards for the last 10 years. People with multiple murders behind their belt. I'm good at what I do and he's better than I am. You're not going to convince me you weren't involved. The question is, is what level of your involvement? What you're looking at right now is a comparison of the frequency of communications between a man and his wife and that same man and his girlfriend. The communications, including phone calls and text messages between Dave, the husband, and wife Peggy are in green, way down here. And up here in blue are the communications between Dave and his girlfriend, Robin. Most palpable is the steep increase in communications between Dave and Robin from March to May, where communications peaked and stabilized. Around the same time, communications between Dave and his wife fell precipitously. This seems like a chart you would expect to see during a stereotypical affair, but I believe you'll find there is something interesting in this chart. Notice that the communications between Dave and his girlfriend declined steeply in June. Also in June, we see a bit of an increase in communications between Dave and his wife. What do you think happened in June? Did Dave realize he loved his wife, deciding to end the affair? No. That cannot be right, as communications between Dave and Robin remained at a higher frequency than communications between Dave and his wife. In fact, the interesting event that occurred in June was actually that Dave's wife died via mysterious circumstances. 911, what are you reporting? Come on. This is my wife. Uh-huh. Hi. She's all blue. She's on the floor. Okay. Was this due to any violence? No, no, no. I was out sleeping on the couch. I come in here. There's water all over the goddamn place. And she she was on the floor. Her face was swollen. She's blue. I tried giving her okay, mouth, she mouth but I can't, I can't get her throat back. Okay. All right. Is your address? Yes, yes, That's yes. That's the house? Yes. Okay. Is your phone number... Okay, let me get you online with the fire department. I'm going to speak first when they come on. One second. Fire dispatch. 911 with a transfer call. At... Okay. Callback is. All right, caller, go ahead. What are you reporting? My wife is down. She's all blue. She's on the floor. Right, are you starting CPR at this time? I got a mask. I'm trying it. All right, do you know how to do CPR? Oh, dude, I haven't done it in so damn long. All right, all we want to do is chest compressions, okay? That's all we need to do, all right? Mm. Is that her right here? Mm. How old is she? I, I can't get air to go in. Okay, just do chest compressions is all I want you to do, okay? All right. After the paramedic arrived, he attempted to resuscitate Peggy, Dave's wife. But Dave ultimately requested the paramedic to stop his life-saving efforts. Police who arrived at the scene noticed that Dave was not crying and appeared to be calm. When questioned as to what could have happened, Dave told the police that Peggy had taken a 10 milligram hydrocodone with a vodka before going to bed. Dave did not sleep in the same room as Peggy, instead choosing to sleep on the living room couch. After he awoke, he went to the bedroom to check on his wife, only to find her unresponsive. That's when he called the police. Police surveyed Dave's and Peggy's house. On the bathroom counter were multiple prescription medication bottles bearing the name of David Pettis. No medications belonging to Peggy were located. When asked where the hydrocodone came from, Dave said that Peggy was prescribed it years ago after she was attacked by a boar. The police asked to see this bottle, to which Dave produced a lockbox. Upon opening it, Dave pulled out a bottle of hydrocodone. But the bottle bore his name. Naturally, Dave immediately became the police's main suspect. 
While the detectives waited for the medical examiner to report the cause of death, they interviewed the people around Dave and Peggy. Interviews with Peggy's family described Dave as being a controlling husband. He would force Peggy to work while he spent the income on himself. He would also belittle Peggy by calling her stupid and similar insults. Peggy's friends and family also revealed that Peggy had no medical issues, drinking habits, or medication. In fact, her job as a school bus driver precluded her from being medicated, and a follow-up investigation would show that Peggy's company had no records of her being prescribed any medication. Moreover, seemingly everyone was reporting that David was acting oddly in light of his loss. A longtime friend of both David and Peggy stated, As soon as David saw me, he walked over to me. I'm gonna tell you right now, he put on the most phoniest cry I've ever seen in my life. Gives me a big hug. As soon as he gave me a hug, the tears were gone, and it was like he had never stopped talking. He was smiling, laughing, joking, and I'm like, what the hell is this? His cry was like when a kid wants something and they give a fake cry, but as soon as you hand over whatever it is they want, a smile appears. Some of Dave's friends and family did not give detectives a very good picture of Dave either. Oh man, what stories they told the police. One friend told detectives that Dave used to work as a tow truck driver for cars that had been in collisions. Dave would steal everything from these vehicles that was not tied down. Dave had also allegedly burned down a truck to collect insurance money. One friend remembered this vividly because some of his own belongings were in that truck. Dave had apologized to the friend about the items being lost in the fire, but one day when that friend visited Dave, he saw those very same items sitting in Dave's garage. In fact, Dave had a habit of filing insurance claims. Over 28 years, Dave had filed a total of 30 insurance claims. For the mathletes out there, that's more than one every year. One time, Dave had reported a robbery in which the robbers had cut his arms and tied a rope around his neck. Insurance companies didn't pay out this one, though. Both the insurance companies and the state police didn't buy David's story. The cut marks were superficial and there were no rope burns around his neck. It was always the arson insurance claims that worked out best for Dave. One of Dave's children recounted that one year, Dave's house was being foreclosed upon. And then, out of nowhere, a John Deere tractor went up in flames. When the insurance came through, though, there was not only enough money to be able to stop the foreclosure, but they had enough to enjoy a plentiful Christmas. There were three more similar documented situations, all with insurance policies that Dave successfully collected. And not only did everyone around Dave notice that things have a habit of burning around him, they also individually reported completely different stories about Peggy's death. That is, Dave was telling everyone something different in regard to his wife's cause of death. As soon as Peggy passed away, Dave got really busy online. Farmers only, plenty of fish, only the best dating apps for Dave. Dave made it a point to get pity points by telling these women that his wife had recently passed away. Some people heard the story that Peggy got entangled in her bed sheets and choked to death. Some heard that Peggy aspirated water. Some heard that she was self-medicating by crushing up several pills and putting them in her ice cream. And some heard that Peggy had left this world of her own volition. And if this doesn't make you suspicious of Dave, Check this out. Peggy had six life insurance policies, with two being taken out shortly prior to her passing. The policies totaled nearly half a million dollars, and the only listed beneficiary was Dave Pettis. Upon further investigation, detectives learned that Dave had met with his wife's biological nephew the day after she had passed away. Dave was not in a grieving state, and he was talking about selling his farm and moving to New York. Peggy's nephew noticed Dave's phone blowing up and decided to do a little phone snooping when Dave had left the room. As a result of his snooping, he discovered messages coming from a woman in New York, a Robin Kaler. 
Detectives took this name and got a warrant for communication data, including phone texts and Facebook access. They found a significant spike in communication between David and Robin the months prior to Peggy's death in June 2018. Dave had also visited Robin twice in New York, telling his family that he was staying with his mother. A text message from David's daughter to Peggy stated, I think dad is in a midlife crisis. I love you mama, but he's gone crazy. Before Peggy had passed away, she had apparently conversed with her husband's girlfriend via Facebook three times. In the first conversation, Peggy stated that she was fine sharing Dave with another woman. In the second conversation, Peggy urged Robin to take care of Dave when Peggy was gone. The third conversation was similar, further emphasizing that Peggy wished Robin be Dave's woman when Peggy passes. But the odd thing about these conversations, besides the fact that Peggy was talking as if she were dying despite being in good health, was the set of phrases used in these conversations. A lexical analysis of these conversations showed that the type of typing Peggy had used in these conversations was markedly different from her usual typing style and that it was, in fact, extremely similar to the typing style of David. For instance, in Peggy's conversations with Robin, she would sign off with sleep tight, but she never used that phrase in any of her other conversations across Facebook. Dave, however, had a habit of using this exact phrase. A more depressing example is Peggy having used the phrase in love several times in speaking to Robin, but never in conversing with anyone else, including David. Dave did frequently use this phrase when speaking to Robin and when speaking about Robin to other people, however. If Dave did indeed gain access to his wife's Facebook for the sake of making Robin more accepting of the idea of being in a relationship with a married man, he quickly changed his idea after the first conversation. Indeed, the first conversation implied that Peggy and Robin would be sharing Dave, but the subsequent conversations implied that a romantic relationship between Dave and Robin would only fully begin after Peggy was out of the picture. Call it a coincidence, but Dave's Google search history shows that he began looking into life insurance shortly after that third conversation between Peggy and Robin. And perhaps this is yet another coincidence, but all the documentation relating to the life insurance policy was signed by Peggy electronically, not in ink. And this was before Corona forced the world into using electric signatures. Detectives had enough evidence to put Dave under the spotlight, and that's exactly what they did. But not before recognizing one aspect about Dave. I'll let Detective Lyle Johnson put it in his own words. Like many narcissists, Dave thinks he's the smartest person in the room and can explain away anything, as well as believing that just because he said it, you should believe him. Sometimes that causes a narcissist to just dig in and try even harder to talk their way out. His body language told me he was exactly that type of person, as he was way too comfortable telling lies. The detective is likely correct in his labeling of Dave as a de facto narcissist. I use the phrase de facto as I've had it drilled into me in psychology grad school that you cannot diagnose a personality disorder outside a professional setting. But let's be real, Dave is a narcissist. He was even arrogant enough to take his story to the local news. Six o'clock, loving husband or calculated killer? Which is it? Deputies believe David Pettis poisoned his wife's ice cream, but he says he would never hurt her. Well, David Pettis was charged with murder, but the charges were dropped. However, prosecutors say they may refile as this investigation remains very active. Tonight, KHQ's Haley Gunther sits down with David Pettis for an exclusive interview. We built this. From the ground up, we built this. We busted our butt to build this for us. They say your home is a direct reflection of you, where you've been, what you love, who you love. Everything you see out here, my wife has touched. David Pettis's wife of 30 plus years, Peggy, is everywhere on their farm just outside of Cheney. She collected wind chimes. She loved her wind chimes. And when that sweet sound echoes in the wind, David says, all he can hear 
is her. That's why I left that one hang. This rural paradise might as well be a world away from the jail cell David called home for more than two months, charged with the first degree murder of Peggy. If I could take her place, I would. If I could go with her, I would. Investigators aren't buying it. Court records paint a picture of a calculated killer far from a doting husband. I have to ask, did you murder your wife? I did not murder my wife. My wife was my family. My wife was my life. But did he take hers? Court records state detectives suspect David laced Peggy's ice cream with a fatal dose of pain medication. All I can tell you for a fact is I didn't put it there. You didn't put any medication in her ice cream? I didn't. The homicide charge against David has been dropped. For now, the prosecutor's office says they could very well refile that charge as the investigation into Peggy's death is far from over. Because a potential murder trial hangs in the balance, neither side can elaborate on specifics. What David could tell me is that Peggy was in pain, especially after this horrific injury to her leg. David says she did what she could to take care of it. She just struggled with it. There there are people that didn't see her all the time that say, oh no, she had just a little bit of sciatic pain. She had a lot more than just a little bit of sciatic pain. He says those who knew them, really knew them, would say their marriage was just fine. But what about the parts and court records detailing an infatuation he had with someone else? He admits he did reconnect with a childhood friend, but says Peggy was okay with it. That woman that I supposedly was in love with told detectives that there was nothing going on. Okay. Did you uh, want something to go no. with her? No. She's family. It's been about two weeks since David was released from jail, but in a way, he's still in a prison. I've left this house three times since I've been out. Everywhere he goes, a cloud of suspicion follows. There are too many people that's, that don't believe in innocence until proven guilty. It's guilty until proven innocent. And that's part of the heartbreaking part. But is it heartbreaking for him? or for the woman detectives believe he killed. Only two people know the truth, and one of them is dead. In Sheeney, Haley Gunther, KHQ, Local News. Well, Haley, thank you. Court documents state that Pettis was aggressive in trying to collect on his wife's insurance policy. He says he was just trying to secure money for her funeral. Prosecutors would not comment further on the case because of the possibility of refiling those murder charges. But again, as of tonight, David Pettis is a free man. In my final year of grad school, I became deeply interested in narcissism. I read through all the theories I could find on the cause of narcissism, and while the theory I'm about to explain is probably not the truest theory on narcissism, I do find it to be the most interesting in that it helps explain not only why a narcissist lies, but also why he believes his own lies. In the Freudian theory of the human psyche, our personalities are composed of three parts. The id, which is your lizard brain, the part of you that feels compelled to act on basic desires. When you see a cake on the table, your id tells you to eat it. Then there is the superego, which is your ideal self from a moral and philosophical perspective. Your superego will tell you not to eat the cake because you've noticed the birthday candles, and you don't want to be the kind of person who ruins others' birthdays. Finally, there's the ego. Your ego is the mediator between the id and the superego. In casual conversation, we say that someone has a strong ego, we generally mean that he's arrogant. But in psychology, a person with a strong ego tends to be biased toward acting in favor of his superego in spite of his natural desires. One theory of narcissism is that a narcissist simply doesn't have an ego. Instead, he has what is called a false self. A narcissist always acts in favor of his id when he can get away with it. The false self then rewrites the memory to make the narcissist believe he has acted in line with his superego. The memory writing process can be as simple as, I never did that because I would never do that. Or it can be a fascinating display of mental gymnastics. And that's what makes narcissists so interesting. They are unpredictable in their lies, but understandable in retrospect. Have you ever been a little clumsy and spilled a little bit of water when opening a bottle of water? 
A narcissist hasn't, because narcissists aren't clumsy. The spill is the fault of the water bottle factory. I just opened another bottle of water that exploded all over me. Apparently I bought a case of water where all the, the waters are overfilled and every time I open one it just erupts everywhere. So I'm covered in water right now. And uh, I knocked my seltzer and my seltzer decides to spill directly on top of the laptop. The detective has identified Dave as a narcissist due to his interactions with him and as a result of the stories as well as the hard evidence on him. As per my interview with him, Detective Johnston assumed going into the interrogation with Dave that Dave would not be confessing. Dave has already gotten away with multiple instances of fraud, which only bolsters his confidence that he can outsmart the police. And while Dave does have a documented history of lying, none of that documentation would ever make it to trial, as Dave had never been found guilty or charged for any of those incidents. Hence, Detective Johnston's strategy was thus to confront Dave with a variety of inconsistencies, thereby eliciting more explanations from Dave, allowing him to paint himself into a corner. By allowing Dave to attempt to explain the holes in his story, Detective Johnston would officially document the incomprehensibility of Dave's story and prove to a jury that Dave is lying about his involvement with Peggy's death. Now let's watch the detective work. Um, so as we talked on the phone, my name's Lyle Johnston, and this is Mark Melville. He's my partner. Um, and just so you know, this room that we're in is recorded. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, let me start by saying I'm sorry for your loss or why we have to be here today, but um, the reason that um, we're involved or is such as if they didn't explain to you, I mean, pretty much any unattended death, is looked at what the deputy said when we, yeah. they were there. Yeah, and then uh, to compound that, um, at the autopsy, there's no um, strong indication as to what happened here. So basically, kind of what I wanted to do was just kind of go through a little bit of history, um, maybe give us some insight in the week um, leading up to her death, you know, anything that may have taken place and um, unusual foods or things like that that maybe we might look at as well as just kind of a little bit of other background. And so going into that, uh, first of all, the other thing I needed to let you know is I mean, I really appreciate you coming down here. You're of you're here of your own free will, and so if at any time this is uncomfortable and you don't want to answer anything, you don't have to, you can leave at any time you want to. Um, all of that. So today is July 10th, 2018. It's 11.23 a.m. So kind of, so before we get into the interview part of this, let me just give a, a little bit of, I've already got your name and everything from the report. Um, David Pettis, Middle L, Ensign LaRue. Yeah. And then, um, you need to take that? No, I don't need to take anything. I don't get a phone to drive anything else. <laughs> uh, and then I've got a 235-8793 as a phone number. Yeah, that's the one you called earlier. That's your home number? It is. Um, and what's your cell number? 710-8849. Uh, Do you work anywhere? Um, I own the farm. I uh, own a log truck that I have a driver in. So, do you have a business number or anything, or no, that's it. Okay. And sometimes we uh, like to contact people, or if we need to send stuff by email, do you have an email address? Uh, it's the same that should be on there. It should say Dave Pettis at Ymail. Uh, I don't think they put that on here. Okay. Well, so I think so. Maybe not. I don't know. I thought somebody had asked already, but... Uh, let me make sure, Dave, D-A-V-E, Pettis, P-E-T-T-I-S, -E -T -T at Ymail. Mm -hmm. And is that, um, is that the only email address you got? Well, oh, that's my email address. Okay. Everything else, we've been kind of slowly shutting down. All right. Too much. 
garbage. Um, and then, uh, do you guys do Facebook or any of that kind of stuff? Yep, I do. Okay. Do you do that under your name? I do. Any other social networks or accounts? Okay, not if I can help it. Okay. Um, did Peggy have her own cell phone? Yeah. Yeah, I think my son has it now. It's, um, remember that number? Hold on a second. 263-4516. And did she work anywhere? Yes. 20 years, but she's willing to share the book her. And was she still working there? Yeah. Of course, they're done for the summer, right? Yeah. Um, and uh, did she have an email address? Yeah, I don't know what it is. I think it's... Uh... Oh, Christ. Peggy, I think it's Peggy J. Pettis. It's either at Yahoo or Hawaii. I don't remember which. I think it's at Yahoo. Um, so, like I said, getting probably more to the point, uh, the report mentions that she had gone and seen her physician here uh, recently. Yeah, we had taken her in for uh, a yearly physical. Okay. Have all her, whatever it is, girls have tested. Right. Um, she'd been having some problems we discussed with the doctor. Um, we suspected that we had come to the conclusion. Just some random conversations would just disappear and be deleted out of her head. Uh, it kind of started. Interviews with Peggy's family would show that Peggy was known for having an impeccable memory. There were no documented signs that Peggy was suffering from dementia or memory loss. Coincidentally, a common strategy used in gaslighting is to tell your victim that she has forgotten conversations that you've had with her in the past. Stay last. Last fall, David. I don't remember when. It was a, there was a, she, she's been our bookkeeper. Period. She went to school for that stuff. So she'd been the bookkeeper for the last 35 years. She'd been the bookkeeper. And uh, and she's always been right on top of things. If, mm -hmm. I mean, she knows that the truck payment's got to be made because no truck, no income. Right. You know. So I'm out on the road one day, and I get a phone call from the our fuel service. I had shut our fuel cart off. Mm -hmm. well, it was kind of odd because the money was coming in, so I couldn't understand why I got shut off. So I made arrangements for them to keep it going. Her about it. She said, there. I says, they, they called us. She said that the bill hasn't been paid for the last two cycles. She went off the deep end. It's been paid. There's a mistake. They're wrong. They just lost track. And so we sat down on the computer and we went through the uh, checking account mm -hmm. and I couldn't find where it had been paid. I couldn't find where it came out of the bank. She started bawling. She was upset about it. She just knew she had paid that goddamn bill. There was no doubt in her mind about it. So we fixed it. We moved on. Like, how long ago was that? And I, I want to say it was a year this fall, but I'm not. I don't know. It, um, that was the on start. That was the worst part of it. And then um, it happened a couple other times. I think it happened with John Deere twice. Happened around the house a couple of times. Um, our dog, I bet, uh, what comes to mind this spring, there was, uh, I've got a, uh, it's a Jack Russell and rat terrier. Let me, so it's like a Jack Russell. He got real sick. So we go to the vet. We found out he probably had cancer or something, but they, they gave us meds for it. So I come into the bathroom one morning and she's putting these pills in a, she, I watch her, she put my mouth three, 
or pills in uh, in her grinder. What the hell are you doing? Dave's not even 10 minutes into this interview, and he's already attempting to plant seeds for the detectives. Notably, Dave is attempting to paint a picture of Peggy having dementia and accidentally overdosing is in line with his fraud goal, as only an accidental overdose would allow for the life insurance claim to be paid out. Dave did actually tell some of his online dating targets that his wife overdosed intentionally due to being depressed. However, he carefully avoids telling the police this version. So I'm getting his meds ready for the next couple of days. Because we are you, you got to explain this thought to me because you're putting four pills in there and you're going to grind them. How are you going to know what you're going to feed, what you're giving the dog? Oh, geez, I don't know what I was thinking. She dumped the back doing like one at a time it's just been little things um a couple of months ago we had to grind grain I mean, it hasn't been that long it was just july so it must have been the first part of june we had to grind we have a hog farm so we make our own feed so we brought the feed home or barley brought the barley home we stood there discussing what we're going to do the next morning that's what that's how we have to do it. this is what we have to get ready and that's what we're going to do Next morning, come out, we went out to grind grain, and she looked right in the eye, and she said, so how are we going to do this? How long have you been married? <laughs> You're not even married, are you? Yeah, I am. Okay. It's a long time. Can you imagine the feeling in your stomach, watching your wife slowly? We've been together 35 years. It's hard to explain when you, you you can genuinely see in her eye that she doesn't know. She's blind. Mm -hmm. She's like, no, we didn't have that, sweetheart. I, I swear to God, did. We stood right here almost at the exact same spot. Well, it's okay, we'll do it again. When we've gone to the doctor, I told Carol about it. Carol says, don't make a big deal out of it. When it happens, you just go through, and she's just... Don't stop her from doing what she's doing. She's the bookkeeper. If you take that away from her, it'll make it worse. And um, so you just kind of double check on the important things and just kind of move on. And she had her doing puzzles. She had a, uh, what do you call it, uh, iPad. So she started doing puzzles on her iPad. That's supposed to help strengthen your memory and shit. So just so I'm clear, Carol's the physician she had. Yeah, she's a... I think she's a PA. Um, it's who Peggy. Her normal doctor is Dr. Staben, but she feels comfortable with Carol rather than Dr. Staben's probably his age. We're in his 40s, you know. Where, uh, where is uh, the her doctor and PA at? At uh, Cheney Life Center. Okay. And how long should we go there? Long time. So um, she's got her doing these puzzles and everything. So did she actually give a diagnosis of some kind of dementia? Well, she just told me. She said what she guaranteed. She told us that it wasn't uh, Alzheimer's dementia. Right. She said because Alzheimer's dementia is more like uh, you know picking up this and asking what it's for. Right. Yeah. She said it's just and it says it's it happens. Sure. You know. It, any any medication for that? No. Nope. Didn't do anything for her. Um, she wasn't on any prescribed medication. She'd had a lot of pain, but she'd been using. She, I take that back. She got bored by a boar a couple of years ago, a year ago, two years ago, something like that, in her thigh. Um, she had a bad right, or no, left and right. Bad left knee, and she had sciatic problems. But she'd crawl around in the garden all day, and then she'd come in the house and. She couldn't, I'd have to help her with her shoes off, help her with her socks off, um, help her get out of bed in the morning and help her. She, she knew that you know, for 35 years, you know, you, you always reach out for your wife in the middle of the night. And if, if you reach out there and you hit the bed, you're, <laughs> you're awake. Sure. She knew that's the way it was. So she'd go in the bathroom in the middle of the night and she couldn't get up off the pot. She'd sit there. And wait and listen for me to stir, or wait for the dog to get down. Because you know, if the dog got down on the foot of the bed, I was stirring. 
对呀、啊，原来是没有跨越过，是成立，因为，跟你怎么样？She has left, and we always try to keep an eye on her. But it got to the point where she was taken three at a time. Didn't wanna. I think her biggest thing. My daughter and I talked about this. I think that her, one of her biggest things was she felt like she was getting old, and she didn't want to come to church. You know, if you if you go start telling the doctor, my hip hurts so damn bad, I can't get around, and my sciatic hurts real bad. When the doctor says, "Okay, well, you need a hip replacement," you just—it's kind of that you're old. Yeah. We just kind of hip everything to ourselves, or we just. Well,、um, so she got this. So a year ago, you said when she got. I don't know for sure, but I think so.、Yeah. She had those, and she had mine.、Um, I had some for some shoulder. I didn't even look. I didn't even look at those yet.、Um, but she'd been taking those、um, for the last couple of hours. Ever since school, especially if school got out, she was taking them before school got out. She likes to come on the weekends. She likes to come on the weekends because she's going to be out of her system in case she got a random share on Monday morning.、Um, and you said that. From getting gored by a, a pig, by a hog, yeah, like one of your guys's, or were you on vacation somewhere? Or <laughs> we had a, I had a boar about the size of this table. We raised pigs. He was probably as gentle as a dog. I mean, he was just. He happened to be in the barn one day when they were sweeping and cleaning. And somebody we were using straw for bedding. Somebody left a piece of bedding twine on the floor that hadn't been cut. She's wearing her knee-high rubber boots. She's walking down the alleyway and walked past him. She caught a foot, one foot in a loop, and the other foot had stepped on the other end, and she tripped and fell. Well, they have a tusk about that long. It went all the way to the bone, up along the bone, and back out.、Um, Luckily for her, it never tore a muscle. It actually went in, in between two muscles in the fascia, and come back out. So the only damage was the skin. But it, it hurt enough that even if the grand, my granddaughter, who at the time was probably, gosh, she just toddling, so maybe a year, she couldn't take her. Right. Yeah, they did. It hurt. It just, it moved. It, they moved enough. They cut off. Had to cut skin out. To trim up the edges to and pull everything together. So I'm assuming that was a trip to the ER. Oh yeah. And which ER did she go to for that? I don't know. I don't know. I don't was know. it an ambulance ride or you take her? No, it was. I don't even know that. I was up north in us. Oh, I so obviously you didn't take her if you were north in us. No, I got the call from my son-in-law. It was a little drama queen. I answered the phone. What's up? Oh, Mama's leg is tore. They, they're, they're taking it. She may bleed to death. We're, they're taking her to the hospital, and it's like, what the fuck? And he hung up. So I got stopped by you guys at the, at the scale coming south. And for one time that I've ever been stopped by the county DOT guys, I was like, dude, this is what's going on. He's like, yeah, dude, go. That's nice. Dave answers so confidently. So I'm assuming that was a trip to the ER. Oh yeah. But he's lying. When asked to explain the details, Dave misdirects. Now he claims to be unaware of the details. Then he engages in a classic narcissistic tactic, projecting. He calls his son-in-law a drama queen, despite attempting to engage in the exact same behavior himself. Dave wants to exaggerate his wife's pain, gets caught in a lie, and then accuses his son-in-law of exaggerating his wife's pain. Dave ends by changing topics, hoping to move the topic away from his attempt at deception. The detectives know they won't get a straight answer from Dave, and will instead contact the son-in-law directly. So, what's your son-in-law's name? Jason. And where did and what's Jason's last name? Culp. C U L P. 
and where does he live? Gene. Is the same, like, right there, to the same address kind of? Or? I don't know what his address is. They live across from the Zips there in a brick house. I don't know. Oh, the Zips in Gene? Yeah. Okay. Um, do you happen to know his phone number by chance? So he's your son-in-law, so your daughter's name? Elizabeth. Um, so that's been the only, like, trauma thing that she's been treated for in the last year or so? Yeah. And the only thing that she... I've got so much going on right now, I really couldn't tell you. Uh, that's the only thing that comes to mind. All right. Um, as I recall, I mean, she had those left over. There were but, but, no, but no other prescribed medications? I don't know, because I don't know if he went through the meds that were there. I don't know what else there would have been. Uh, so all that comes to mind to me is there the only prescribed meds I can think of. Okay. Um, I can't think of anything else. The only thing that drew concern to us is um, I talked to my daughter studied to be a pharmacy tech, and her sister is a pharmacy tech. Is that Elizabeth? Or yeah. She's a pharmacy tech? No, she's not. But she studied for it. She studied for it and passed it and was on her way to be in there, but she chose to be a I think it's a CNA or something else. Right? Okay. Uh, so, all right. And anyway, we noticed when the deputy was there, there were it's her little lockbox. She keeps her her meds locked in a lockbox because the grandkids mine her up in the cabinet where they can't reach it. But hers, are, she kept them right there. But there was a random pill on the bottom. And we looked them both up. They were both. I don't ever remember another prescription that she had, the kind that I can think of. What about you? Uh, any prescriptions? Yeah. You got another page. <laughs> Come on. Um, I take, uh, well, right now I'm on. Like just eating the yellow pills and like one or two milligrams just to help me sleep at night. Um, and it seemed to me that I read in there that you uh, get some of yours filled through the VA. No. Is that? Correct. No. Were you ever in the service? Well, thank you for your service. What branch? Army. Army. Okay. Um, can you see a doctor here locally or do you, you, you go to Dr. Stable? Yep. So pretty much our whole family does. Okay. All right. Um, did you notice any of your medications missing or anything? I hate the damn things because they make me just like I have a hangover the next morning. Uh, when I began this discussion, you know, I said over the prior week, is there anything that you can think of that was unusual? Did you guys go out to dinner anywhere unusual? Um, did, 
you know, was she acting unusual? Anything? No, that Peggy's interest? probably, <laughs> my wife is probably the most upbeat person you could ever imagine. Sure. She makes you sick to your stomach in the morning <laughs> because you get up in the morning and I, if I don't get through my first coffee cup, don't talk to me. Mm -hmm. She gets out of bed in the morning and she's like this. Oh, she walks around like the goddamn good fairy. Uh -huh. It just, mm. morning people. <laughs> no, Peggy is, uh, God, you could probably talk to 1,500 people, and out of 1,500 people, you couldn't find one person to ever say that she was in a bad mood or felt bad, or she was always that lift you up um, person. So nothing unusual there. The, the uh, I think maybe you had told the deputy or the medical examiner, there had been a recent life insurance policy, and for that policy, she had to go to the doctor. Was that Dr. Staben as well? No, or? that was Carol. That was the day we were in there. Oh, okay. Carol. She had gotten her life insurance policy, and they said that she needed to have an annual. They come out. We didn't understand it. it. She'd been working on this for months, and they'd just been dragging their feet. They, they sent a nurse out. They did a physical and all this shit. And then they run all the paperwork like, oh, it will be done in about a month. It's going to take about four weeks. Mm -hmm. Four weeks come and go, eight weeks come and go. And then we get an email that said, oh, you got to have an annual physical. You don't have an annual physical on record. So she went and saw Carol and had her annual physical in there. Sent that off. Beginning of June or something like that. Oh. It's not like she had... A ten million dollar policy or something. Fuck, they don't. Which only had one hundred fifty thousand. We didn't even pay the mortgage. For sure. Who was that through? Detective wife, I think. Is do you, do you have like a local agent or something? No. Like, was it off of the internet? Yeah. Or? Yep. Yeah, we'd spent, I don't even know, since last fall or something looking for health insurance because, or life insurance, because she had, uh, she had two girlfriends in a short period of time. They were just, died. One was 43 years old. Mm -hmm. One was a gal she rode a bus with, committed suicide. Mm -hmm. She was the same as Peggy. She was always the smile and all over. Just a beat person. She tried to quit smoking. They put her on Chantex. Chantex, Chantex, oh, whatever, whatever the hell it is. Yeah, know. they give you the warnings on that stuff. Yeah. How many people have you ever known have a side effect of committing suicide? Right. Yeah. yeah. She was the one in uh, however many million. She went home one night, sat on the porch, a bottle of wine, took her husband's pistol, and sat there and put a break on. Do you have life insurance on yourself? No, oh, they wouldn't give it to me until I lost weight. But you, you, you applied as well? Oh, yeah. yeah. We said that to talk to the same agent at the same time she got hers. Okay. And um, he said that uh, in my weight, that was, I don't know, 290 pounds then. He said, you get down to 230 in a week, get your weight way down. Reapply this fall. He said, but when you reapply, don't tell them you lost 100 pounds in a year. Right. Because I'll add 50 back in a good month here. Yeah. You know, just make sure you go in every month or so to your doctor and, you can document your weight loss and that you're, you know, you have your physical. So that's what I've been doing. I started last November at 348 pounds and size 48. I made it to uh, 268 pounds yesterday. And I just put on a pair of size 40 this morning. So we've been fudging along. It should have been my cheerleader. Yeah. Um, couple of questions about you okay. uh, related to uh, June 12th and uh, 2012 I got mugged out on the highway um, pulled over on the side of the road to paperwork and um, car pulled up behind me pulled out of an angle just like steam folded on some bright lights on 
sat there for a minute. I figured it was because I was straddled over the white line that if they had my lights on, I figured I was going to get a ticket. So I did the, the one rule that you're not supposed to break, and I got out to walk back to see what, mm -hmm. what was up. And uh, just about the time I got to the ring wheels on the train, which was all the mouth, we opened up. Again, one of those double edged, just slides back and forth. And I kept trying to really just... Anyway, in the end, uh, did you report that incident? Yep. State Patrol was there. Adams County was there. Oh, that was over in Adams County? Mm -hmm. And did they arrest anybody out of that? Nope. Nope. Less than a week later, they had the same guy strike down in Gresham, Oregon. Mm -hmm. I got a call from Oregon State Police, I think it was. She uh, she questioned me for about a half hour on the phone. She says it's uh, it was uncanny to her because my description of what happened was like the guy down in Gresham read what I wrote and said almost the same thing other than the clothing that they were wearing. And that uh, I had a crown pick behind me, and I think down there, an SUV, a Ford SUV or some shit like that. But other than that, it was the same thing. And that guy down there, I don't remember how many stitches I ended up with my arms. I mean, I had one on my face, I think. That guy down there, it was a guy, he took like 17 stitches and one big tub right up his arm. I think that was a guy that I read that he was, he had been training in mixed martial, not mixed martial arts. He'd been training in some type of fighting thing and so he was a little more aggressive than I was mm -hmm. and he took a pretty good cut. Mm -hmm. Anyway, in the end they left me on the side of the road. Um, they had put the, he had a buddy that came around behind me and put a rope around my neck, drug me around in front of the truck. I remember going past the headlight and then I blacked out. When I come to, I was just covered in blood standing in the middle of the road, scared the shit out of two college kids that were getting off to take a leak. So do you, uh, obviously, medication, did you ever do anything additional to address that? No. Go to counseling? I went to counseling. I saw a psychologist. I saw a you know, lot of you know, a psychologists. Psychiatrists. He tried to tell me it was because I had trauma from my, my mother and all this short shit. I came out of there feeling madder than when I went in. Yeah. So I ended up seeing a psychologist here in town for about a year. He was a pretty good guy. I think, he, I think he deals with the, I think he deals with the city. Um, when all things considered, uh, when the autopsy report comes back, do you have some idea as to what the cause, what happened here? Well, when I talked to the, to the, um, medical examiner, examiner. Mm -hmm. um, I, he said there had been a little bit of water in her lungs, which coincided with when I started, um, chest compressions out of the water just mm -hmm. come out of her mouth and nose. I tried to do it mouth to mouth at first. I couldn't get her. She was not stiff, but she was heavy. Right. I didn't realize, you know, I picked her up before when she was alive and I've been able to carry her. I couldn't have picked her up. Yeah. It's, I, it's uncanny the difference between a, a lot. How the hell does that happen? Yeah. She weighed buck fifty, buck sixty. Mm hmm. I can carry a buck fifty. Pretty damn easy. I've picked her up out of the bed before. I've helped carry her to the pot. I've picked her up off the toilet, and, and it was easy. Man, I'll tell you what, it was like she was glued to the floor. Yeah. Um, when I found her, I grabbed her by the wrist to pull her, because she was kind of curled up by the bed. I tried to get her drug into the bathroom, and, and uh, dude, I had to look and see if she was hooked to the bed. Yeah. It was just unbelievable. Yeah.
But um, anyway, I tried giving her mouth to mouth, and I couldn't get anything to go. And I thought, well, I knew how to do CPR, and I knew that if you raise her neck up, and you pull her head back, and should open her airway, I should be able to get air to go in. So I just kind of panicked. I called 911, and he asked if I at least knew how to do chest compressions. Right. So I started doing chest compressions, and I, told, I think I told the guy in 911, I said, there's water coming out of her mouth. He said, just keep going, just keep going, keep going. Sure. CPR doesn't seem like it's a, it should be a difficult thing. When you've got your hands locked, all you're doing is bouncing up and down. Fifteen minutes seemed like fifteen hours. Mm -hmm. I've, I've already had, I got shoulder problems. I've been sleeping on the couch that night anyway because they hurt. By the time they got there, I felt like somebody ripped my shoulder out of its socket. Mm -hmm. It, um, yeah, you just don't. It's not. You, you, you don't understand something so simple will just become so difficult. So anyway. Um, my daughter said worst case scenario that she could think of because we, when I talked to the medical examiner, he said there was water in there, but he wasn't sure that that could be enough. And uh, he already knew. Then we knew that she was taking at least two or three at a time. We didn't know how many, but we knew she'd been taking two or three at a time. She'd been taking them at, at night. She'd been, uh, she makes, uh, she buys these mics. Lemonade. She uh, loves that damn mango shit. So she'd been taking that. And she'd make she'd been taking her pills at night. So we knew she'd been doing that. Well, Sunday when we were at the store, the kids had drank her last bit of mango rum she had. So where she grocery shop on Sunday? She said, "Oh, let's get this. I haven't had this in a long time." Monday night was the night first night she had had rum instead of. Um, Mike's. Oh, okay. So, it was a big part of it. I thought too, we looked it up online. To, uh, we pulled it up online. Uh, I think I still have it saved on the side. Elizabeth and I read through it. And after we read through what it was saying in there about how it, um, it's slow, she was breathing. Just, just to be clear, you're talking about Elizabeth, your daughter. Daughter. Yeah, okay. I was going to say the medical examiner investigator's name is Elizabeth as well. Oh, is it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so we started reading through what was online. Okay. And, um, we were finding things in there. Oh, that... uh -huh. this is, it changes. Exactly what it said, but it changes the um, the uh, changes the way it works. Uh, interaction with the, the alcohol. Yeah. So our first thought was the way what we assumed was going to come back is that we're going to find I don't know what the alcohol content is going to be, but we know we're going to find alcohol in there. Depending on how we know she took that stuff somewhere around five o'clock, but now we're wondering, did she forget she took it and then took more, you know, seven, eight o'clock at night? So we don't know what's going to come back there. But we did she drink much? No. No? Peggy wasn't a drinker. She had her Mike's Hard Lemonade. Okay. Um, what is that? Three, four percent alcohol. Maybe. Right. And then, um, Sometimes we have a bonfire at night, and uh, she'd have uh, the kids would all be out there drinking beer and wine. The kids, would, the kids always thought it was funny to try to get mom drunk, because mom's a hoot when she would drink. So, uh, in a, and then evening where just the two of you are at home, how many mics or lemonades might she have? Uh, maybe two. Maybe two. Yeah, I'd have a beer. If I had two beers, she'd have two micro lemonades. And then, so on a this evening where she may have drank rum, I mean, was the bottle still there when? Uh, yeah, Elizabeth found David. David or one of my kids found the bottle, pulled it yeah. down, and the shoulders were off it. But I don't remember how full they make them. Well, um, I don't know. I don't. I don't know if they're in the neck when yeah. they're full. 
or if they're just at the top of the shoulder, if they're just, I mean, off the shoulder where the neck hits the top, it was down about that far. So we figured there was at least two or three shots missing out of it. Okay. Pretty close to it, which isn't much. For sure. And I mean, she drank it in a glass about that big. Um, that night she had uh, a bunch of fresh blueberries, rum, and ice cream. And she makes a float out of that. Yeah. And um, it's easier to take her. For her, she called her mom, but it was actually her ex mother in law. She stayed with us for a long time, and she was on these big hydros, steady for diabetic nerve pain or something. Mm -hmm. So she used to crush them three at a time for mama. That's how she was prescribed them, I think. Okay. So crushing her pills was just an everyday thing. So she would have crushed her pills and put it on this float, right? So if she had taken more than those three, would she have made herself a second float or? No, worst case scenario. Well, I don't know. It's, she couldn't have made another float because the she had to have drank her float because it was washed out in the sink. No, like she always does. So she had her float fairly early. Right. If she'd have had more. I don't know what she would have drank with. I don't know if she'd have mixed them with milk or mixed them with Seven Up or what she would have done with them. Okay. Uh, I didn't really pay much attention. I usually have this little glass by the sink. I didn't even look at it. Um, to see if there's anything in it. Because sometimes when she crushes her pillow, she uses that little glass with Seven Up or milk. But no, there wouldn't have been milk in it. I don't notice that. So it had to have been something else. If she, if she had taken more, we don't know. I have no idea. Okay. Um, were uh, your kids there that evening? Did they come over after this happened, or do you remember? After it happened? Yeah. Yeah. They oh, were, shit, yeah. They were there right away. Uh, oh, no. Oh, I don't know who called. I think the, EM, the EMTs or the deputy or somebody called. Called them? Called the kids and let them call. Um, I was a fucking wreck. Sure. Um, it was really funny to my mom and dad lived with us. Um, all the commotion. There must have been, it seemed like 50 people in the house. Well, you had slept through that shit. So, to that, who all, you just mentioned your mom and, your mom and dad? My, my dad and his wife. Okay, your dad and his wife. Live at the house. With if us. I remember right, you're, you're from New York, weren't you? Mm -hmm. Okay. So your dad moved out here, or I moved my dad up to Tennessee. Dad oh, had okay. some had some health issues in Tennessee, uh, and uh, we got separated after I got out of the military. Him and my mom got divorced, and he went one way, and she stayed up there. And when I went to the military, we kind of lost track of each other. How old is your dad? Uh, Seventy-four, seventy-five. And his name? Bill. William. William Bill. Bill. Porter. Bill Porter. Porter? The P O R T E R. Um, and his wife? Nancy. Nancy. And they both live there. Anybody else live there in the same house? No. And then, if I remember reading in the report, uh, she uh, had a sister that lives close by as well? Yeah, next door. And what's her name? Uh, Melissa. Melissa. Um, is that like the same piece of property, or are you guys two pieces of property side by side? Uh huh. One house on one piece, one house on the other. Okay. Uh, what's Melissa's husband's name? Or uh, Walt. Walt. Anybody else live on that property out there? Yeah, her daughter lives with her. That's uh, Katrina. Katrina. All right. Um, Anything else that you can think of that we might need to know? Shit. I have no idea. No idea? I have no idea. I, it's, um, I've been beating myself up over this for the last two weeks. So you guys have been married 35 years, you said? We've been together 35 years. We've been married. We were married uh, 85, so what's that, 33 years in, in February. And no, there's never been a harsh word between us. So marital-wise, things are good? Yep. You can't. 
you'd pay hell finding anybody that ever said I mistreated that wife, except maybe her sister. They had a falling out back when I got hooked. But this Melissa yeah. had a falling out. Yeah, Peggy and Melissa did a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, but I think they recently they've been talking to each other, so it was kind of just a made up type thing. But no, it's um, I married my best friend. We hit, we just happened to. It's, there's been such a, I could have never found anybody in my life that I could have gone along with better. We just fit like two pieces of puzzle just perfectly. Um, we just, do you have any questions? You've been talking about she usually drinks the Mike's Hard Lemonade, the mango, that the kids had drank the last one. When was it that you guys had went and bought the rum? Oh, no, the kids didn't drink the last Mike's. She drank the last Mike's. Yeah. The kids had drank the last, finished off the last bottle of rum. That's what we accused them, right, because the damn bottle of rum was missing out of the house. And if there's rum, if there's hard alcohol missing out of the house, it's one of the kids. Okay. What kind of rum was there? Oh, fuck. I don't know. Is it a flavored kind? Yeah, it's mango. Oh, it's mango rum. It's mango rum. Oh, yeah. So she likes the Mike's Hard Lemonade mango, and then she likes the mango rum as well. Yeah. Yeah. Just imagine. Have you ever had a mango? Okay. Can you think of anybody in their right mind that would mix a mango with fucking blueberries? No. <laughs> can't say that. That just sounds disgusting. So is it Malibu? The white bottle? Clear bottle. I couldn't. While you're looking for that, yeah. let me let me ask you. Uh, when you say the kids, uh, so Elizabeth and her son Jason, you guys got other kids locally? I uh, all the time the kids were in high school. Peggy and I had a little bit house. Hmm. Um, when they were in middle school be freshman in high school and a classmate commit suicide because um, of something that was going on at home. So our two biological children are David and Elizabeth and uh, we've always told them that if you have a friend at school they're just having problems and, and you think that they're in danger I was driving school bus the same time as the parent to bring them home. But, you know, don't, if you think they're going to end up on the street, don't let them end up on the street. Right. Just bring them home. We'll make a spare bed. The rule is when they get here, they have to call their parents and let their parents know where they're at and that they're safe and just bring them home. So because of that over the years, we ended up with a Quite a few kids in and out that were from single family homes, most of them. You know, and it causes a problem when mom and dad split. It's always every, every one thinks it has to do with a husband and wife. But it affects the children a lot worse sometimes than it does the parents. And a lot of kids will go out of their way to cause conflict with whatever parent. Like if the kids stay at home with mom and they want dad back in the picture real bad, they'll cause conflict with mom, hoping that she calls dad for backup. Yeah. So, in the end, we ended up with a lot of kids that sometimes would be at the house for a week, sometimes would be at the house for a month, sometimes would visit and be there for a week this month and a week next month and just on and on. So that's when we end up with probably, I'm going to guess how many kids call me dad, call me mom. That's, it's never been Dave and Peggy, it's always been mom and dad. So yeah, I have a shitload of kids that call me dad. Okay. So you're saying it could have been any one of these kids that, well, I suspect, I, I don't know who, who took it, but we just, we always know that, you know, if it gets to the bottom and there's a party going, if we're having a bonfire or something like that, and the, and the kids come in to get a drink, the first thing you do is look up, because Peggy makes her own Kahlua. Mm -hmm. We used to go to Montana all the time to get that real hard. The Everclear? Yeah, the 180 proof, 180 or 190 proof. Yeah. She used to make... Uh, 
I say that was Kahlua. Kahlua, right? She made her own Kahlua out of it. There's probably still some of that up in the cabinet. I can't stand it, but it's too damn sweet for me, even with the bite. Anyway, uh, didn't mean to interrupt but what his yeah. question was, but you were looking for. Oh, uh, I was going to see if Elizabeth knew what. Um, It wasn't a big deal. It was just the reason I was asking is because uh, usually those flavored ones, there's a much lower alcohol content. So I don't know if there was one that had a higher content. Um, I think it's just one sip. Not anymore. What, I, uh, what were you taking? I don't even know. Um, I had a depression for a while. They started me off something. All of a sudden, I had a reaction to it. it took me off of it. I don't like prescription shit to screws in the Peg and I experimented. She had me on vitamin D, huge dose of the vitamin D. And it just seemed to help a lot. We started, I've been on that vitamin D now for I don't know how many years. Um, so some sort of antidepressant that you're taking for that? Yeah, that was... Especially when they started all this, this crap through the state where they're, you know, if they can list you as being depressed or something like that, take them voluntarily take your guns. Yeah. We're not fans of that. Uh, if Peggy had a best friend, who would that be? Her daughter. Her daughter. Elizabeth. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, anyone outside the family? And uh, he and Elizabeth, that lived, they've always been each other's confidant for years. And what about for you? You got a best friend? Or My son. David? A narcissist naming his son after himself. Many such cases. Anyone, our family's close. Anyone outside the family? Um, I have my best friend. I have family friends from back east, you know, that I tend to. But, no, if I've got somebody here I need to talk to. It's always my son. Okay. He, uh, he's old enough. He's had enough experience in life. He spent four years in the day. He's not a kid anymore. But, uh, any other questions for So out of the two of you, you must work the hardest because you've got a shitload of work. Right? <laughs> he has. Well, so this <laughs> is my case. Um, Here's uh, a name that I'm going to bring up. Who's Robin Kaler? Dave did not expect the detective to know about Robin. After this interview, Dave started accusing his family members of speaking to the police. He said that he would obtain the police report to find out who told the detective about Robin and ruin that person's life. Was, uh, my best friend in high school. Does she live here locally? Or? No, she no. Where she lives? She lives in New York. Um, someone saw her name somewhere and thought that I should talk to this person. Uh, sorry, I can't tell you for you to lie. that's where I get Yep, that's where when we sell the farm, that's where I'm headed. Is back. I'm going back home. Um, it was uh, Peggy's wish, I think you were wrong. Was her wish that anything ever happens to me? She said, that's, that's, you, that's where you need to go. You need to go home. I when was the last time you saw Robin? Uh, in March, when I went back to visit my mom. Okay. And your mom uh, is still alive back in New York? No, Wilma's still alive. I have a woman that I call mom. Okay. Uh, when mom and dad split, so I know so much about kids. Um, when my mother and father split, I had a, another family that took me in. That's why we started to do it here. He passed away in November. And uh, I went back to the funeral. And his wife, Barbara, uh, once it's Alzheimer's, or anyway, she doesn't, she'll look at you one minute and know who you are. Look at you the next minute. And
So anyway, uh, I'm very sure she was getting a little bit worse. And I talked to her daughter on the phone. And I went back and visited in March. Maybe I would have triggered some of my. Just because she's, I think now what she is. But she asked that I give them home. Again, I were making plans to sell the farm next spring and move back to New York. What part of New York is that? Catskill Mountains. It's the other New York. The other New York. That's north. Yeah. Uh, any particular town in that area? Yeah, right back to my hometown, Never Sink. Never Sink? Is that what you said? Never Sink. Never Sink. One word. Oh. Yeah. All right. Um, this may not really amount to much of anything, but like I said, I just know. because... I have no idea how it could. I mean, it's... Well, um, as you probably have already heard from, you know, the medical examiner's office, the toxicology report and such will take several weeks to... Several weeks? Mm -hmm. Nice try, buddy. Don't, don't, don't schmooze me. <laughs> when I first talked to him, he said three fucking months. Yeah. Then all of a sudden it's five months, and we go down here to get Peggy shit, and now they're telling us we got to wait up to eight months. Yeah. Well, what the fuck is wrong with this state? It isn't just the the state, but I mean, it's crazy how long we end up waiting for some of this stuff in order to be able to. We have one crime lab in this state that takes care of every single medical exam medical examiner in every single law enforcement office in the state for for that type of work. You're right. You know, that's beyond stupid. Well, we should have at least four. We I just I got a really good friend of mine that's a cop up north. I've known him for 20 years. We just had this talk the other day. He's like, what this state needs is four of them. There should be one on the this side, one here, one over here. Yeah, come on, one over here. Mm -hmm. Should be four of them. You can't have a client lab back eight months. I know. Yeah. Unfortunately, we don't write the rules and yeah, get I know. money out. So, yeah. But anyway, right. it's... Um, Any questions for me? You're doing your job, but I don't have a question for you. I'm sorry. We, we figured we were going to be sitting here sooner or later. Well, um, the number that I called you from is my direct line um, to my desk. So okay. if you end up with any questions or anything you think I should be aware of, I don't know call. what there is. I mean, we've spent the last couple of weeks, and I talked to my daughter, and she hasn't mentioned that mom. I mean, we all, everybody says the same thing. Like, well, the first thing they're going to do is they're going to say it was suicide. They're going to say it's somebody killed her. And it's like, how the fuck can somebody have killed her? You know, nobody would have hurt her. Nobody would have ever hurt her. And she's the last person in the world that would have ever taken her own life because she's never been depressed. She's beyond sickening when it comes to that damn morning person thing. There are days, though, might like to. Yeah. But, yeah, so... Um, there is anything else? Oh, uh, in terms of her, that on her float or whatever, what kind of a grinder did she use? Did she have like a coffee grinder? Did no, she just no, smash a little? There's a little plastic thing that's at the house somewhere so that she grinds up. She does the dog's beds in it. She does her beds in it. She's done mine a couple of times in it. You grind up your meds? Oh, I tried it one night. <laughs> I didn't like the outcome. Oh, what was that? Oh, I, uh, she took uh, one of my muscle relaxers and... Uh, Water, drink it down. Some pills affect other people different. I mean, she's she's got a different system than I do because I'm gone. Don't even talk to me. You're not waking me up early anymore. 
she was taking sometimes three of those and get up in the morning and still playing in her back hurt like a bastard. Um, I talked, I think it was Melissa, her sister said, Walter, her brother, her husband's the same way. They don't help them at all anymore. So either A, there's just, you take so many, your system just gets used to them, or you just, your metabolism just isn't, isn't right. Um, and so to help her out, would you prepare her, her floats for her? Or? Oh, fuck yeah. 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 Um, but, but you were able to make sure she was getting the amount she wants, like three pills or something like that, because you were saying. No, she'd get her pills out. She'd take care of her stuff. She'd come out, and we'd sit there almost together, you know, and she'd be like, well, give me the blueberries, give me the ice cream. Or, well, because you see, it's, it was our nighttime Snack, you know, she'd have a float, I'd have a bowl of ice cream. Well, I met with her pills, though. You were talking about grinding them up and, and putting them on her float, right? I was grinding them up on her float? No, either one of you. She'd grind them up, put on her float, right? I suppose maybe at one time or another she's handed me the grinder and I've put them on her float. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, like I said, if anything comes up, I'll be back in touch, or if you think of anything... Well, I'm sure I probably will because we talk about this almost every single day. Sure. Um, either one of the kids or I would just sit there and try to hash out and try to, I mean, we spent the first week trying to put this all together. We were hoping that the toxicology report would come back and give us some kind of final answer as to just what the fuck was going on. Sure. But okay. now we're sitting here at, um, it's tied up. It's, it ties it. It ties right. everything up because we can't even draw her insurance to barrier. Right. Um, so we're we'll take her out to her retirement. I think. I don't know. I got a list of mistakes saying to get her retirement. I can either take it every monthly or I can take it all in lump sum. So we'll probably end up pulling her retirement and using that to try to take care of some of the bills because. We're still digging through a mountain of paperwork trying to figure out what bills are paid and what bills aren't paid. And most of the time, it's like, hey, first thing you do, you just sit down and wait. And sooner or later, we're going to get a notice from somebody saying that they're going to shut our shit off if we don't pay it. Right. That's a bill we need to pay. Yeah. Absolutely. Your organization, she's good at paying bills, but when you go into her, my desk is here, her desk is here. She'd use this computer would be for the bills, and this computer would be to look shit up. And... It's, it's like there's a, you know, some monster just threw up all over all of it. And it just keeps coming in every day. It just, something just popped into my mind noticing your shirt. You said that you work at a trucking company in a farm, but you've got a shirt with your name on it that says a butcher shop. You work in a butcher shop too? No, my wife and I were in the process of building our own butcher shop on the farm. As we go. Got my new pants all this morning. I put on a nice clean shirt to go with it. Well, everybody's always looking for a good butcher shop. I was just curious. So. Yeah, I uh, I've got a mentor in, in um, St. Paul's like medical league that's uh, kind of been helping us through the stages of getting our butcher shop built. Mm -hmm. We're we were pretty close. He told me he was taking about a hundred calls a day during deer season. Oh yeah, sure. And he keep threatening they you know, as soon as that shop's done. Yeah. Alrighty, sir. Well, it is it is twelve twenty one. The conversation turns to rapport building and Dave is ultimately let go while the detectives continue their investigation. The toxicology report arrives showing Peggy died from a fatal dose of hydrocodone. The detectives bring Dave back for another interview. Having already been through one police interview and gotten away, Dave likely believes that he's in the clear. Moreover, some of the people around Dave have changed their stories to match Dave's. It is documented that Dave wined and dined some of these people, and their stories changed to align with Dave's immediately after said whining and dining. What a coincidence. Notice the drastic shift in Dave's body language in this second interview. 
Dave is in full confidence that he'll be getting away with his wife's murder, and that is immediately clear from his posture. Detective Johnston is aware of Dave's newfound sense of confidence and suspects that Dave believes that the detective will simply ask a few follow-up questions, let Dave go, and close this case. Dave couldn't be more wrong. So, as I told you the last time this room was we had over in such, and you're aware of that. So, and say that again, an 8,000 pound, 8,000 pound shoulder, uh huh, lived in with a cable that's rated for 30,000 pounds. And he breaks, and he breaks the cable. So, was, um, you, you kind of told me a little bit about this before. Um, so, you lease your truck to this guy or something, or how does that work? Oh, kind of. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, I was, I was just curious. I'm not in the logging industry, so I wasn't sure how really, <laughs> how how this works as far as you told me before you were a, a owner operator kind of yeah, thing. I own the truck, and he keeps it busy. Okay. Um, well, let's get to it and get get down and whatnot. Um, just to kind of go back over, um, has there been any changes still living at the same address, same phone number? Yep. Everything's the same. Okay. All right. Um, so what I'm trying to do is kind of just put the finalization on this so that when um, the toxicology report is finalized and everything is done, I've been out, you know, kind of Slow rolling this, I guess you might say, because nothing was happening at a, at a quick pace. And a few people have told me some things that I wanted to um, kind of follow up on um, and get some additional information from it. All right. So um, we are in the recorded. Oh, I forgot the date and time and all that. It is, uh, it is October 17th, 2018. It's 1245 hours here with Dave Pettis, Detective Keezer, and Lyle Johnston. Um, and I've already advised you the room is recorded. And that's yeah. what you're, okay. Um, additionally, today, um, I'm going to advise you of your constitutional rights, just so that you know what they are. If there's any questions, you have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can will be used against you in the court of law. You have the right to talk to an attorney at this time. For any questions, you have the right to have an attorney present during the questioning. If you can't afford an attorney, one well, will be appointed for you without any questioning. Sir, excuse me, pointing for you without any cost before any question if you so desire. Do you understand those rights? Yeah. Okay. Um, any, are you okay with what's going on and talking with well, me? Yeah. Yeah. So far goes. All right. Um, so, reviewing some of the photos from the house and what Peggy was dressed in that night, were those her normal bed clothes? She had a pink t shirt. And a blue sweatpants. Is that what she would sleep in? No, I had them dress her. Oh, you had them dress her? Yeah, they, so, she was laying there. By the time they took her stuff off, she was laying there naked. Oh, they were naked in the homes. Okay, so those clothes were added after all of the medical intervention stuff. Um, what would she normally have been sleeping in? Or what happened to those clothes? I, I have the foggiest idea. Um, I don't even remember what the hell she was wearing that night. The only picture I have in, in my head of hers that night is walking in there and seeing her. She looked like a blueberry. That's the only thing that just stuck in my head. Um, I couldn't tell you what she was wearing, honestly. Okay. I have no idea. She normally wears some kind of nighty, and I don't remember what the, I, I don't remember what she was wearing that night. All right. But she was, was she dressed for bed, or was she in, like, her daytime clothes? No, she was dressed for bed. Okay. She goes to bed. She gets up, even though she wasn't in school, her, her internal clock was still set for 4 a.m., so school or no school at quarter to four. She, she was up, so she went to bed sometimes by 36 o'clock at night. Okay. Um, and Bill and Nancy uh, were living there. What time do they normally go to bed, do you know? Not much longer after Peggy, because Dad's... Dad doesn't sleep well, uh -huh. so uh, I don't know. Sometimes they go back to the room six o'clock. I don't know if he sits there and plays on a computer, or if they go to bed. I don't know. They have a computer in their own room, <laughs> separate from yours. Um, what was in the evenings? Uh, 
prior to bed or at dinner time? What was kind of the usual practice for meal preparation and that kind of stuff for the four of you? Um, sometimes mom made dinner, sometimes I made dinner. If you're going to ask me who made dinner that night, I couldn't tell you because I can't even know what that way I had for dinner. Okay. Um, it, it just depended on who was doing what for the day. If mom was home, then she would make dinner. If I was home all day doing something, you know, around the house and I had time, then I'd make dinner. And then after dinner, Mom liked to have dinner sometimes six, seven o'clock. Peggy didn't like that. She always liked that when she was home. She liked to have dinner early because we were meal a chance to study before she went to bed. <laughs> but okay, so um, on that particular evening, any idea what time you guys had dinner? Was it early or late? Must have been. I I would guess somewhere around five o'clock or something like that. Because Peggy usually went back to the bed. I think, I think that night she went back to the bed somewhere around six or something. But I don't know. Okay. And um, when you guys are having dinner, do you all sit at the same table or is it kind of a, you no, know, it's a sit in front of the TV type thing usually? Do all four of you sit in front of the television and kind of watch the television yeah. while you're eating? Yeah, usually. Okay. Um, would Peggy take her medications around dinner time or right at that time? And so it would depend on what kind of mood she was in or how bad she hurt. Okay. Um, sometimes she'd, take, she'd come in in the afternoon from outside at 3 or 4 o'clock and take some pills. I don't know what she took when she came in, but um, it just depended on the day. All right. It was, there was never a set routine um, because most of the only things she took at night was either her vitamins or her pain pills or her vitamins. Just, there was no set time. All right. Um, and on this particular evening, do you recall, was she hurting extraordinarily bad or? Now, you know as well as I do, you know the answer to that because everybody you've talked to so far has told you that that woman was in pain almost 24 hours a day. And I sat right here and told you the same thing last time we had this talk. So I go out in that garden and crawl around on her goddamn hands and knees, weeding all day long. Mm -hmm knowing that when she was done, she was going to have to have help to get up, but it didn't stop her. Sure. You've been married 25 years. Or so about us. Yeah. Now, if your wife is doing something like that and you tell her don't do that, what's the chances that she's going to listen to you? You know, it depends yeah. on the day, right? Yeah. So, so we all told her, you got to stop. You got to slow down. I'd go out and sit with her. I'd empty her weed buckets so she'd have to get up and down. But that woman hurt so bad from day to day, she walked with a noticeable limb. And she, when we cleaned house, we found, found a lot of surprises that she had that we didn't, we weren't even aware of. And do you want to tell me what those surprises were? Well, we found a total of six bottles of uh, sleep aid type pain relievers. We found three extra bottles of melatonin sleep aid. Um, we just, my daughter started finding them and then she's like, I don't understand this. She's going through five or six bottles of this shit a month. That's just nuts. And that's Elizabeth? Yeah. yeah. When you say your daughter? Um, yeah, she was just here in October and we started, we were cleaning and stuff and we found a box that Peggy had ordered and there was three bottles of, of, uh, what the hell they call it, DM, like, I don't know, yeah, okay. type stuff, and uh, a bottle of melatonin in there. All right, it was already three bottles of that in the cabinet, and another two bottles of melatonin. Where did you find those things at? In the medicine cabinet. Okay. Um, and then on this particular evening, I know this is rehashing what we already talked about, but I just want to make sure I got the facts. So on this particular evening, but she's feeling so bad. What is it that she made at the end to relieve her pain? Well, you were talking about she makes a toddy every night. She either uses ice cream, well, you know, mostly it's ice cream and uh, like smart lemonade. Okay. Um, that night, as I recall, it was ice cream, blueberries, and um, some kind of flavor cream on it. Sleeper was now. Um, I'm trying to 
took my tongue to. I don't know. You've got it in a note. So anyway, some flavored rum and ice cream and blueberries. All right. Okay. And um, as you recall, the medication was mixed into that to help her sleep. Yeah. Or because she was having some kind of trouble in swallowing. Don't swallow well. Okay. Do you know if that was ever mentioned to the doctors, um, that she didn't swallow well or that she's having any no idea? Um, what about, if I recall correctly, there was some mention, and I don't know if it was you, maybe you would know better, or if it was one of your doctors, something about being alert. She, had, she always took, uh, they made her itch, so when she took them, she took Benadryl with them. Um, do you know where she came up with that mixture at, whether someone told her about it? No idea. Have you ever heard of someone doing that kind of thing before? So first to me, usually if somebody has a problem with that. Doc, let me call you back. I'm sitting here with the detectives again. All right, is it important? All right. Good, good doctor when they're calling you on your cell phone. I need a doctor like that. No. <laughs> oh, I think it's a doc. No, doc. Oh, oh doc. I'm like, man, my doc never calls me on my cell phone. Kid. All right. Um, so I became aware that Bill and Nancy decided to move out. What sparked that? Don't even ask because I had no fucking clue. All right. Mom told me it was because every time Dad walked out in the garden, he saw memories of him and Peggy sitting there weed together, and he was starting to have pains in his arm and his chest. So other than that, I have the foggiest damned idea. Um, are they still here in the local area? Yeah, or they with Davis. Okay. And you would have more of an idea than that. If you know they moved out, then you have a better idea why than I do. Well, I don't really have an idea as to why they moved out. I just heard through the grapevine that There's they no grapevine. You heard from my son. No, actually, I didn't, but okay. that's beside the point. Um, so what about with Robin? You know that I've called and talked with her. Yeah, are you aware that you put her in the hospital? No. Apparently, somebody from the state of New York came to visit her and put her under such stress and duress that her diverticulitis ran her white cap through the roof, and she spent three days in the hospital mm -hmm. because somebody was telling her how suicidal I was and that I had probably gone on the Internet and made this fake account of Peggy's and that that's who she was talking to and not Peggy. Did you do that? No, I did not do that. Okay. And so have you talked with Robin recently? Oh, uh, once or twice, but after she went in the hospital, her family's pretty much said that's enough of that shit. Hmm. When, when, when about the last time would have been that you talked with Robin? I don't even know. She texted me a couple times here and there, emailed me just to check on me, but we don't really talk. Okay. All right. Um, your daughter, Elizabeth, did her last name used to be Schubert Schaubert? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, who's Alyssa Jeffers? Alyssa Jeffers. A neighbor. A neighbor? It used to be years ago. How do we go? There. Um, so, what about Wendy Penter? What about her? Who is she? Somebody I met on the internet after my wife died. Okay. Is she someone that you met in New Jersey? Yeah. I did go to see her in New Jersey. Who'd you go to see in Florida? What the hell's this got to do with it? Well, I'm making a timeline of things that have happened here. And okay. I'm just wondering if you can tell me. I went to see a high school friend. I spent a couple of days down there, and she got just a little too, let's just say I wasn't into what she wanted, so I came home. Okay. Um, what What is her name, by chance? Uh, Kathy Missouri. Kathy Missouri. The reason I bring up some of these um, names is that, like I already told you, I mean, talking with family and such, a couple of people have suspicions that this isn't all that it looks like, I guess, on the outward appearance. So let's hear it. Well, what happened? What truly happened? Truly happened where? With your wife well, and her medication. Now, you um, 
we're telling the family that she's taken three, four hydrocodones with alcohol. And I can tell you that a portion of the toxicology report has come back, but not in total. Um, the toxicology report would indicate she didn't have any alcohol. And the hydrocodone that she had taken that evening, crushed up, was 10 times the therapeutic amount, which you don't don't typically get that much in your system just by accidentally, you know, taking three or four pills more than you should. Okay. What's well, 10 times? 10 times? Well, the therapeutic amount would have been the amount probably within one pill. All right. Okay. Okay. So that means she would have had 10 pills. That's not possible. Unless well, that's why I can't even see where that could be even possible. What medication, what medication did you give her the night before? Because she went over and told Melissa that something was making her go. Oh, she took, uh, what the hell was that she called? What was in that, that bag? There was trazodone. Trazodone. Okay. She took trazodone with her hydros that night. She said I gave her a hangover the next morning. She wasn't going to do that again. And you told me that you had gotten the trazodone from an unknown person or a third party, mm -hmm. and who is that? Well, I'll prefer not to bring him into it, because then this is just going to snowball into a pile of shit. Okay. Well, I think that it might be in your best interest if you got the trazodone from somebody else to tell us who that might be. Why is that? Because this is an investigation into what caused your wife's passing and the fact that she's got trazodone in her system. Not very much she had trazodone in her system that night. Well, she did. Really? Yes. Well, then I would have no idea how the hell it would have got, because I can't imagine her taking that again. Okay. Well, the pharmacy would say otherwise. You've, you've gotten a prescription back. Well, as well as you had a more I did in a, in a more significant amount. Peggy only got 12 pills. If she's taken three to four pills at a time, she's going to go down through that in a very quick. And somewhere in there, somebody probably would have told you that her when her mother passed, she had three 90 count bottles of that too that just miraculously disappeared too. Her mother did? Yeah, Sylvia Edwards when she passed. And how long ago was that? Oh, Christ, I don't even know. She got her leg hurt, let's see, 2016, so Sylvia must have died. 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. She used to bring the 90 count thing from moms all the time. I don't And that was about it. She kept them locked up in the lockbox after the first of the year because when the July covered on July, but when June come around, I had locked them all up. Okay. Well, I can't imagine. Even for life, I can't imagine for life me how she would have had ten pills in her. That don't make no sense. Even well, as she was taken four at a time. You talk about crutching the pills up yeah. and, and putting them on food or something like that because it can absorb into your system uh, much faster. Perhaps you don't have to have a total of 10 pills, but um, at the same time, that's still a significant amount. Yeah, it is. More than what Pam, as you had told us earlier, I mean, supposedly she had alcohol. She has no alcohol in her system. Um, Robin said that you told her this story about Peggy getting her leg tied up in the sheets, and none of the photographs or the testimony from the uh, deputy that was out there has any indication that the sheets were wrapped around her leg or that she had fallen. The deputy also tell you that when we had came, when they got there, she had already been pulled away from the bed, pulled into the bathroom where I could get to her good enough to do CPR. I think that you indicated to the deputy that she was laying on the floor pretty close to where she's at and you rolled her over. Well, I think that that's a little off the mark a little bit. Okay. When I came in there, I'm pretty sure I told the deputy that when I found her, she was face down on the floor with one leg still caught in the sheets. 
I pulled her into the bathroom where I could get to her and started CPR. When I started CPR, I started pushing on her chest, a massive amount of water and fluid came out her nose and mouth. The guy from the corner said, well, that's normal sometimes. To some degree, what we call purge is normal, but it's not normally a mass amount. Dude, this was... I don't think it was a coffee cup. I mean, at the time, it sounded like it felt like a coffee cup of milk because there was a lot of freaking water. But I figured it was probably just a, you know, like a big swallow of water. Her water was spilt there beside her bed. I picked her glass up in the process of what they were doing because I was trying to keep my, I was sitting there on the edge of the bed watching them. I picked up her glass. I put it up on them. I can't remember if I put it on the dresser in the bathroom, but it was there. Okay. So, um, have you talked with the life insurance company? Well, no. Well, one I did. They sent us a claim. The other one, Elizabeth found. She says it's it's dated for July 20th. I think was its effective date. So I don't even know that that was going to come into play. Although Elizabeth talked to some gal on the phone that says that um, it may. So and that's the policy that you just applied for, the 150,000. Yeah, there's two of them. One is through AIG, and the other is through Protective Life. The Protective Life we found when Elizabeth was here, it's dated July 20th. But I think they said that um, it somehow it came into effect two days before. But they'll probably fight it, the gal on the phone says that because it happened within two years, they'll fight it. So right. really, that one's probably just well, replaces the way to down. Right. Yep. Um, talk with them about that very fact. They have a two year um, yeah. policy of. Uh, what do they call that? Uh, you're right. I mean, basically, they have yeah. a two-year period whether they disagree whether they should pay right. you or not. So yeah. at this point, there's one. There's a hundred fifty thousand dollars policy. What can you pay off the mortgage or any of so And that's through AIG. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I think she's got a. I think she's got a burial one through work. I can't remember what the total is. I have, but it's still the same thing. Uh, when you say it's the same thing, I mean, it's, um, there's nothing can be done until this is all finalized anyway, so we have no idea what's going on with it. Okay. Um, so, the Plenty of Fish account, did you start that before? I started that, what, a month? No, fuck no. How the hell did I start that? I don't even know. I, July, August. It must have been almost September when I started that. Okay. Um, and Rita? Who's Rita? Steph. Rita is somebody that was my, my friend's girlfriend. She lost her husband in 2011. She came here to visit because she knew what I was going through. We went on a motorcycle ride, and we went on a motorcycle down, ride down the wall wall to see a friend of ours that's in the penitentiary. Period. End of story. What's Rita's last name? Uh, Chamberlain. And she doesn't live here locally? Yeah, she lives here in Spokane. She's with her husband boyfriend right now. Okay. Well, as I said, I've talked with a number of people, and there's a sequence of events here that doesn't look right. So okay. Right? And uh, from, I think, almost any outsider, you're going to say it looks suspicious. And to your family, it looks suspicious. Okay. okay. All right. So what I'm wondering is, I mean, why did this happen? Because I don't think that it was... At this point in time, looking at all the evidence that that has been presented to me, it doesn't look like any type of an accident. This yeah. looks like, I think back in November, you made a trip to New York. Yep. Yeah. You meet up with an old high school flame, and you start thinking of a different life. And from there, things kind of spiral out of control or whatever. A plan is put into motion, and here we are today. Okay. Well, I don't think you're a little off the mark there, but okay, I'll bite. All right. So, what was the plan? So it wasn't a plan. 
Well, you go one year from you're making a new business, a butcher shop, that kind of thing, to the next year you're ready to sell the place and move. Your family says that you're completely sporadic. One day you're going to the coast to retire. The next day you're staying here. One day you're going to... And they told you this was all after my wife died. So, of course, yeah, my mind was get the fuck away. Well, I don't think it was all before. But I think if you had talked to my dad, he would have probably told you that my wife and I had already planned on selling a place this spring from last year. Last spring, we talked about this 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 spring coming up about selling a place and either moving to the coast or moving back home. So I've been here with her and her family for 30 plus years. That she wouldn't mind going back to see my family. She knew my mother. She knows my cousins. She knows everybody. That isn't. That isn't what everybody else is going on. Finger shitting. That's so. because not everybody else is privy to what goes on between my wife and I. Well, and I, and I agree with that. But I mean, that's, I don't know what to explain. I don't know how else to explain it to you. Okay, we were pretty quiet to our kids. We didn't tell our kids everything. It's not their business to know everything in our life. So we didn't tell them everything. So now, because we didn't tell our kids everything, now all of a sudden this is going to come back and bite me in my ass. I don't think so. Well, that's your. Here we sit today. Yeah, I don't know. And the fact is, is like I said, she's got a significantly higher dose in her bloodstream than what you described. Um, you at least so told her a couple of family members that you had crushed the pills of put in. I never told a single family member that I crushed her pills. Well, that's not what they told me. Well, I don't care what they told you. I never told a single family member that I crushed her pills. Where did that pill crusher go from? She bought that pill crusher from wherever, some little place in town. I don't know if she got it from Powell or if she got it from Bymar or where she got it from. Good day. Sure, it's a pill crusher? Well, it's a little round thing. You put fills in, it's got a space in the bottom to hold them. So I am pretty sure. Sure, it's not called a marijuana grinder? Well, pretty sure. Think she could have bought it at a marijuana store? I don't know. No idea. It looks like a marijuana grinder. I just saw a picture of it. I don't think it is. It looks like a marijuana grinder. That's why I asked. I mean, when you go on the, um, you go on the internet and look for a pill crusher, I mean, it's almost the same exact thing. So, I don't know. I thought a marijuana they're, grinder. They're more, they're they're more commonly found in marijuana stores to grind marijuana than they are pill crusher. I, that's why I asked. I've never seen a pill crusher in like Walgreens or somewhere. I think Bymark's got them. But I'm not sure. I don't know. I don't know. Um, but it's got compartments in the bottom. Why would a marijuana thing have compartments? When you grind the marijuana, the the uh, crystalline substances, the THC falls out and goes to the bottom, and that's what's collected. And but there's no there's no screen on this. It's just two little plastic. I haven't seen that other than picture. picture. It's just two little plastic textured things in there that kind of grind against the. Yeah. There's nothing going on here, obviously. Regardless of what you suspect, there's nothing going on here. I mean, I spent time on the couch, and it's not the first time I spent time on the couch because of my shoulder. Right. Um, what, not too long before this, I had gone in to have an MRI done. They said that it was narrowing in there. And if you've done all this, you probably know that too. So. Yeah, a pinched nerve, it causes problems. And the pinched nerve feels like it's bone on bone in there, and the only thing to do is get my arm up in a neutral position to make it go away. Well, I get that. Um, like I said, there's a sequence of events, though, that seems fairly odd. And it doesn't just seem odd to me. It seems odd to those people that would be closest to you and your wife, you know. Um, and based on what you're talking about, I mean, I suppose there's the possibility that if you really thought she was suffering, maybe there's an alternate here, then you just want to go off and live a... Look, I was married by this. I was with this woman for 35 years, okay? This woman was my life, period. You know, you go someplace and you, when you introduce some, this is my better half. Well, I can, I'm here to tell you that if anything ever happens to your wife, you're going to learn that your wife was not your better half. She was a lot more of you than what half. This woman was my, this woman was my life, period. Um, I have nothing but emptiness without her. Um, it's just, 
every day I walk out in the garden and I swear to God I could see her in the garden, kneeled down, weeding in the garden. You know, that's the problem that Dad said he had, is he just, that's what Mom said, that's what their reason for moving is. When Dad goes out there to weed whack and stuff like that, it was just so overwhelming to him. So he could just imagine what it's like to me. You know, I go out to feed the animals. I've gotten rid of the majority of the animals because when I go out to feed the animals, I'm filling buckets and I'm sliding buckets over to the side thinking she's grabbing the buckets full. She's not there anymore. Okay? Yeah. I go through this every single day. All right? Yeah, I got a plenty of fish, and if you read the damn thing on plenty of fish, you can see on there that I'm looking for somebody just to hang around with. That's all I want. I wasn't looking for a one-night stand or a fling. I was looking for company in my life, somebody. My dad moved out. My kids, for whatever reason, my son doesn't talk to me other than this morning. He's like, started to come around. But there's nothing. My kids have their spouse to go to. They have their children. I wake up in the morning, I roll over, I have a fucking dog beside me. That's it. 35 years I had some woman beside me to love me, to hold me, to touch me, to nothing. It's like putting a crap head in a goddamn room with nothing but a toilet and taking everything away, just cold turkey. I mean, it's, it's the worst feeling in the world that there is. And I can imagine that it is. I can imagine that you've gone down this path, but now you have nothing. I mean, at the time, when you went back in August and visited Robin, she somewhat said this, some of the same things, that maybe things seem somewhat suspicious. And she and said in the beginning, she said, when they came to me, she says, I first thing went through my mind, and she's like, no, that's not possible. Not possible. But yet that thought is there. It's crossed a couple of people's minds. Right. Yeah. When did you go back to see Rollo the first time? And I'll be honest, I've never read the case. He's my partner in my office, but there's ten of us. I didn't go back to see Robin the first time. I went back for my stepfather's funeral in November, and Robin was at the funeral. There was no go back to see Robin. Okay. I went back there for the funeral. And uh, Robin and I kind of met up at the funeral, and Things started to push the wrong way, so I left early. I came back home a week early. Told my wife what had happened back there. She said, well, I think she even talked to Elizabeth. I'm not sure, but uh, I told her, I said, that things just got a little uncomfortable to me, so I came back early. And uh, we talked about it a little bit. She said, look, she's 2,600 miles away. I'm here. I have the ring on my finger. She doesn't. That's where it left off. My wife and I were about as open as I, we had no secrets between each other. If something happened, I'd go to her and I'd tell her. You know, when I came back in, I can't remember what it was, March or something like that, I told her, or I was joking, I don't remember what the hell it was now. Anyway, I told her that um, I had still had feelings for her and that for your wife? No, for so, Rob. I said, you know, after 40 some years, it's amazing. I said, I, I still have feelings for her. And her and Robin had a conversation about it. They talked about it, Rob. Peggy told her a long time ago, she says, you know, if anything ever happened to me, it'd be nice to know that he's got somebody because if I go, he's, he'll lose his fucking marbles. Here I am. So, because I get out there and I'm trying to find somebody to be with, now all of a sudden I'm the bad guy. Well, the problem was is that, I mean, part of that happened before, you know, your wife was out of the picture, because Robin indicated to us that you tried to make it romantic. I mean, you guys are sleeping in the same bed. She's trying to comfort her, and you're coming on to her, which made her uncomfortable, according to her side. So, yeah, well, when I stayed there in November, there was only one bed available. When I stayed there in March, there were two beds, and I stayed out in the second bed in March. Isn't that when she came out and laid down and rubbed your back and well, all that? that was because you were having a hard time breathing? Then no, that was way back in November. Okay. And my wife knew all about it. But then, did you tell your wife before you went back in February? Tell her what? What happened in November? Yes. Yeah. Staying in, she and then, well there. And she didn't have any problem with me staying with Robin the second time. And, but Robin become uncomfortable about it. I don't know if she did or not. I have no idea. I'm the one who left early because I was the one uncomfortable about it. So what is... When I came back home, I told you the same thing. It's just that I, 
I said, I can't do this anymore. I said, it's just, I'm afraid such something's going to go. And then Robin had said in March or something like that. I think it was March when we went back. She said, well, I got a really interesting text from your wife. And I said, what was that? And she, I can't remember what the hell it was, but she read it to me, what the text was. And that basically the text from Peggy led her to believe that if something should happen between us, that it wasn't a big deal because she was here and she was there. She knew it wasn't going to go anywhere. And so what was that call about in March or whenever it was that you came back, uh, the message that that said to you that there had been some, yeah, I needed a way out. You needed I a needed, way out? I needed a way to get that out of there without raising a big stink. So that's what I, that's what had happened. I got a message from my son, said, I got to go. I changed my plane tickets so there was no big stink made, and I left. And then, so that was just a, a kind of a quick made-up story or something like that? All right. And then uh, you'd originally planned on going back in July when, right after Peggy's passing? Uh, yeah, I did. Because yeah. I wanted out. Same thing my son did. I don't, know what the, I don't know why you see a problem with that. I wanted the hell off that property. I wanted off that property now. If somebody showed up that single day that she died and said, I'll buy this property, I'd have sold that one just in a minute just to get the hell out of there. You can't be in one place for 30-some years and make that many memories and be comfortable there without the person beside you. It's, it's impossible. A little bit. And then you, you went to Rockwood Clinic with Peggy during her physical, mm -hmm. told the doctor that if that's what it was. Okay. So she had memory problems. Docs. She said, just keep an eye on her. Let her do her same things every single day. Just periodically check, check on her and make sure that, you know, she's on track. Thanks. But don't make a big deal out of it because the extra stress would cause more problems. But again, um, mm -hmm. I don't think that that's quite what the doctor told you. Well, I don't care. You don't care? No, I don't, because I was talking to one who was there. And the, so the, the physician told me that because you were afraid that would affect the life insurance? No, nope, it wasn't anything to do with life insurance. I didn't want the, the brand. She didn't want the stigma. Did, did she ever talk to anybody? Well, yeah. We talked about it a couple of times. Her grandmother or mother or whoever the hell it was, somebody had had it. And uh, when we got online and we read about it a couple of times, apparently, I guess it's hereditary or something. I don't know. But the reality was that Peggy hadn't, like, forgot to pay the bills. It was more that you guys couldn't afford to pay the bills. Uh, no, I think you're a little off there. I mean, we were making $10,000 every two weeks at the time, and we are in pretty good shape. But your account has a lot of overdrafts in it. It sure does. It's had a whole bunch after she could have been gone. Well, even before she was gone. I wouldn't, no, I wouldn't know because I didn't do the accounts. She did. did. Um, so... Hearing from the rest of the family, the, the reason the bills weren't being paid was because you couldn't afford to pay the bills at different times. You wouldn't agree with that, or what? Well, no. In the first part of the year, I mean, we were supposed to be off a month. Sometimes we were off four. We only had savings for two. Right. So we went through a couple of months that we weren't able to make truck payments, but the bank was okay with us because they knew we caught up. So it wasn't a big deal. Okay. Um, so you would still stick by the fact that you believe she didn't make the payments because she forgot? Well, back when she forgot, supposedly forgot to pay the fuel bills, uh, that was sometime a year or so ago, uh, we were on the Avista job, and we were making pretty damn good money. There was no reason why the fuel bill wasn't getting paid. That's just, that's, we take that percentage right off the top. That's what's supposed to get paid instantly. No fuel, no truck, no truck, no money. Right. So other bills were okay to let slip? Well, on some of them, yeah. the, the whole number one priority was the house and to keep the keep the truck rolling. All right, um, let's see here. 
If I wanted to take a look at your um, cell phone, would you be opposed to that? Oh, probably. Probably. Um, is there something that I shouldn't see? I have no idea. Is there something you're looking for? Um, text messages, search history from a variety of whoever you're texting with. Okay. So what does that have to bear on what? It has to bear on the relationships that you might have or um, the various things, whether you've talked with anyone. So let's, let's say for a moment that this is a planned event and Robin is your lover. Then okay. Is she involved in this? Sure. No. Okay. Well, those are the kind of things that perhaps I would be interested in making certain of. Okay. And perhaps part of the reason why I'd maybe like to take a look at your phone. Is that okay. something you're willing to let me do? I might. Okay. Um, do you mind giving me what your passcode is to your phone? I don't have a passcode on my phone. Um, what about if I wanted to look at your home computer? Does it have a password? Yeah. You might tell me what the password is for it. Well, I probably do. Okay. Um, the AIG um, life insurance policy. Mm -hmm. Do you have an agent for that? Shit, I don't know who he is. Don something, but I don't know who he is. Here locally? No, shit, I'll floor that. You bank anywhere other than the credit union? No. Well, yeah, I think she's got an account on this TCU. It's still there. Nobody's touched it. Uh, who's the guy that drives your truck? Uh, Rory Powell. Rory Powell? I know Rory. Do you? How do you know Rory? Rory used to drive for Peterson Logging and for uh, the guy over on Oh, uh, Dennis. Uh, yes, I can keep Yes, I know the word. I can't remember his last name. Dennis. I've done a lot of logging. Yeah. Who are you used to now? Surely. Been there for no, a Yeah. Been there for a while. Known him too. And you said you sold most of your pigs at this point. That kind of thing. So mm -hmm. is that going by the wayside, having a butcher shop? And all no, a butcher shop's still there. I've got a men's group that I belong to. The guys are pushing real hard to keep the butcher shop going. Everybody's like, that's what your wife and you started it. You should finish it. Um, and I think I mentioned on the phone or asked you about, do you have someone else living at the house right now? Yeah. And who's that? My other daughter moved in. Who's that? Brandy. Brandy? Randy. Brandy. Did you say your mother's daughter? No. Oh, I thought you said my mother's daughter moved in. I was like, that's your sister. <laughs> yeah, we're from the mountains. So yeah. That's what we are. <laughs> uh, no, Randy was a foster child that Peggy brought in from her bus route. I don't even know how long ago. Right back in the old single man. So she'd always been treating her like a daughter. She wants to, well, and then continue the farm. Her and Elizabeth got together and worked out a deal. With her. Elizabeth wants to keep the farm, says if she wants to come home to the farm, she wants something to come home to. So she's been pushing hard, so don't, don't make big decisions like that for at least a year. Okay. You know, until things are all, you got to let this get behind you. And everybody that I've talked to, uh, when I went home to see family in, in August for my sister's wedding, a couple of them have lost, and everybody's like, man, you, as hard as it is and as much as you want to get away, everybody says the same thing, you got to wait a year. You got to get through what they call the first, the first, first Thanksgiving without, and the first um, Christmas without, and the big task would be getting through February because February was our month. And um, so if we can get through those. So what's Randy's last name? I think she goes by Hagen now. It was Hagen Albertson or something? Like that. All right. Um. You know, in a lot of respects, it seems that you got to be one of the most unlucky guys I know of. Dude, I have the foggiest damn idea. I just, 
this has been such a roller coaster ride that it's just it's hard to even put words to some days. You know, there's it came off the beginning. I wanted nothing to do with anything or anybody. I mean, I even my daughter told me that you just you become a troll. So nobody wants to be around you. You know, angry. You know, it's very beginning I said I did nothing but blame myself you know you and Robinson beginning you knew that she was taking hydros and you know she'd been taking hydros for a while so that makes you responsible because you were an enabler you didn't put your foot down as a husband and say no that's enough you just let it go how long had she been taking hydros she'd been taking hydros since 2016 when she got hooked by a bore um, either my prescriptions or hers or mom's or wherever else she could get them. Well, she couldn't have hydros around. She just was taking these yeah, pills. She fought like hell trying to get sleep. The kids all know that. David wouldn't know that much so much, because David barely comes around more than about once a month. And David and Elizabeth, Elizabeth probably knew more about how much Peggy hurt than anybody, because Peggy or Elizabeth was there two, three times a week, because she lived right in Cheney. And Peggy used to complain to David all the time, because he'd only come around once a month. Sometimes he'd come twice when then two months he'd come once you know so the problem is we have kids that we don't tell all our secrets to so they speculate you know they just go on that little bit that they know and I understand that that makes common that makes perfect sense to me you know you see a little bit of something and because you're not there and you're not privy to everything that's going on so you take one little thread that looks out of place and then you just start pulling on it and you just think that this is this has got to be what happened because this is the only thing that makes sense and uh, you know I can understand that I mean you have a woman here that was perfectly healthy other than having sciatic pain and that and the problems with her leg um, she was perfectly healthy she didn't have problems she quit smoking years ago she didn't have health problems and all of a sudden, one morning, you know, in the middle of the night, you get up and there she is laying dead on the floor. That's a problem. But I'm pretty sure that I'm pretty sure that was the coroner that night that was there, that young kid, although it may not have been. But he was from the medical examiners. I told him that when I found her, her leg was caught in the blanket. And I know for a fact I told him her leg was caught in the blanket. She heard she was face down on the floor. Her left leg was wrapped up in the in the sheets, and her headway, her head and shoulders in the doorway of the bathroom. When I found her, I rolled her over, pulled her into the bathroom, so her waistline was probably about at the bathroom door, which gave me room to sit on top there and basically do chest compressions. And when I started doing chest compressions, water came out of her nose and mouth in what I would call a considerable volume. Okay. And that led me to believe with the spilt water there that she choked on the water. That's the first thing I thought. And when I talked to the coroner and had a conversation with him, he said, well, it depends on how much of this hydrocodone was in her system, because hydrocodone slows your breathing down, so she very well could have. But he didn't know until he got the toxicology report back. So I'm the one that pushed to expedite the toxicology report. I called the governor's office. I called Kathy McMorris' office. I called over there, left a message, finally got a hold of somebody in the lab. On uh, July 3rd, I think it was. Some might say that you did that because you wanted life insurance from the wife you just killed. Yeah, that would be different if there was a half a million dollars or a million dollar life insurance policy. I could certainly understand where you'd go down that road. But if, even if both of these life insurance policies came to the light, that's $300,000. I don't pay off everything. Do you understand my job is being the devil's advocate? Yeah, I understand that. Yeah. How long have you had the second? The other, the, not the life insurance policy that's probably going to be a question that's probably not going to How long have you had the other one? I don't know. A year? Six months? Oh, no. Five years? Um, we started looking for life insurance just before her birthday because she was told by somebody at work that she had to find life insurance. Uh, within the first six months of turning 65, 64. So you had two life insurance policies, one from one company, one from another, both per 150? And they were just taken out recently. Yeah, I don't know when they were. I want to say I want to say AIG was somewhere around April or something like that. Who's your, do you have life insurance through all those companies too? Now I'm in the process of, but I haven't got, uh, I haven't got it done yet. In fact, I think, I think the company that was AIG, I think they're putting me over to some somebody else because of my weight, the AIG turned out to be too expensive. If they lose more than, I 
don't even remember what he said, but any week that you have weight loss, significant weight loss you have within a year, the life insurance company turns around and adds that back because they say people can't keep it off. And that would have put me way up. Like, I can't remember. Maybe lost a bunch of weight or something? Yeah. Or gained a bunch of weight or something? No, I lost a bunch of weight. I was about 350 last year at this time, and I'm down, well, I made it all the way down to 260, and I'm back up like 275. So she was a big significant part of that. She she pushed, she helped, helped me with portion control. Yeah. I'll put everything. Who's the, uh, was it the same agent that was able to arrange both of these policies? No, it wasn't. Um, yeah, I don't remember who they, I think they're both out of Florida, but they weren't the same agent. It seems all life insurance companies, for some reason, are out of Florida and New York. And then did she have anything through work? Yeah, it was a burial thing. She was only like five grand. In the end, I think the letter that came showed it was like for 15. 15 grand? Yeah. What did she do for work? I've been school bus driver for the last 20 years. Should sure. I remember some sort of? Yeah. Yeah. Is that what the 15,000 was there? Well, no, that's one of them. That one already, that was her. That was her retirement. The state sent that. And uh, we got caught up on bills because the first month we didn't, I didn't pay a single bill, I don't think, the first month. I don't know if bank calls, so don't need to worry about it. Everybody's pretty much the same way. Don't worry about it. You'll get caught up. Because every year, this, is a, this was the second year in a row that we were supposed to be out. We we're supposed to have a breakup for a month. Two years ago, we had a breakup for a month, and then he started finding problems with equipment that led to be one month late before. And we were kind of protected there. We had credit cards to run above. That kind of helped us out. This year, we were set for one or two. I can't remember what we were saved for. We were saved for a little bit this year. But same thing with the bank suites. We fall behind on the car and the motorcycle and the truck, and everybody just kind of let it go because it's the logging the bank knew. And we've got the bank that we deal with. They've got several log trucks, so everybody knew that you get caught up. Once the summertime comes and things, when the logs start rolling, bills get paid quick. But as far as debt, yeah, we have trouble in the springtime every year. So you can't hold a log truck and not have financial problems in the spring. It just happens. And as I recall, um, you were kind of reliant upon the farm kind of thing to see you through that portion? Or? Yeah, a lot of it, yeah. Right. They're pretty good. She ran the farm. She ran the books. She did. But she did so much, and you don't realize just how much. I told you, it's more than your other half. You don't realize just how much of your life you depend on that woman until they're gone. Um. Right. Like, I started going down this road. You know, it seems like you have quite a streak of bad luck. So, on the day of her memorial. You wrecked your Harley, I understand? Yeah. Yeah. And the uh, insurance company settled that out for you? Mm -hmm. What happened there? Uh, I went to go for a bike ride uh, because my son, James, came to me in the middle of the memorial and got right up in my face and told me that this was not a, um, I can't remember exactly what his words were, something like, this is not an honor to mom ashamed of you because Rita was there, I assume. Um, and it upset me. I was, you know, it was an issue, so I wanted to get out and get away. So everybody had thought that I'd been drinking all day because I had a beer in my hand all day. I had the same damn beer in my hand most all day. And so they assumed I was drinking, so I eased on down the driveway of the bike, and one of the guys stepped out and said, oh, no, you're not, you're not going anywhere, isn't he? Pulled, he slammed right into my cowl and knocked my bike over I didn't think there was that much damage until we sent it to Harley. And Harley came back and said it was like they come up for like thirteen thousand dollars of damage. But Harley Davidson doesn't paint. They don't do body work. So if it's got a scratch, they put brand new. And if it's got a bracket that holds it, it's got a screw in it, they replace the whole bracket. Right. So my son took it for a ride and said there was some problem he thought in the steering. He said let the insurance have it. We were gonna rebuild it this when we looked at it, we could buy to the insurance lady, so that's way too much. We said we could rebuild it cheaper, and had there not been something wrong in the steering that we didn't know. 
we could have rebuilt it. If we could have, then it wouldn't have been totally. And so, did you get a new Harley out of that? No. Nope. No. Nope. My daughter said no. Your daughter said no? Yep. She running the show for you? She was. I value her opinion, and her opinion was that my head was not where it needed to be at this time of year, and having a bike, just, you need, if you're on a motorcycle, you need to have a clear head. She asked that I wait. So I did. Okay. Um, what was your insurance claim prior to that? I don't know. Um, the insurance company told me that there were at least four different fires surrounding your residence and, and such at different times. Um, there was one on a tractor um, that was related to a guy who was now incarcerated that was my business partner. Um, he used my record to move cars off of his property, uh, take them to scrap. He brought my record back one day and somebody called while I was there. I heard him on the phone just screaming at him that I had taken the cars off the property because somebody had seen my record. And I uh, said they were going to get even. And um, somebody had come in in the middle of the night and piled a shipload of tires up behind my tractor and set the tractor tires on or set the tires on fire and it burnt my tractor in. So it didn't really total my tractor, but the cost of the tires, I mean, it was like a $6,000, but new tires were damn near that, so they totaled it. And then um, Sam Cates, the guy that drove for me, lost a, he had a truck leased to me, um, the dash caught fire on, um, down on 195. So he was in the truck when that happened? Or? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Yeah, I don't remember what else was out there. I met another fire years ago. I'll take from the the recent, there's those two were in the last few years. Yeah. And then you had a semi stolen from you? Mm -hmm. Over in Post Falls, was it? Mm -hmm. Did they ever recover that? Not that I know of. Did you get paid out for that? They just paid it off. That was it. I didn't get any money out of it. And then, and your most recent one with the Harley, they paid that off. You have a loan against it or, or whatever. I think I'm still responsible for some of that, but I don't know. I haven't got through all the mail yet. I've got a box on the table today. And got, just a day, I don't feel like looking at the mail, so it just goes to the box. And then I, when I have days, I sit down and dig through the box to see what's there. So what's your financial situation now? Well, that's about the same it has been. This last paycheck wasn't real bad, but it wasn't great. Um, well, the bill's going to be closed down here for a week, so he's got a couple of the halls he's going to use. But we're picking up. Okay. All right. You got anything? No. Well, Dave, uh, like I said, things things just don't add up, and it's part of the reason why I needed to call you in here and talk with you today. Yeah. Um, if there is anything that you need to tell me, that was time to do it. Well, I told you everything, and I mean, well, I think the last message I had from Rob was a joke. You guys got enough Wi-Fi shit here. I sent her a picture on Tuesday of me and my old log truck. She says, nice picture, was that a strategic job? And I said, no, restocking 80 and 100 footers. Have you had another, during your relationship, you and your wife, have you had other relationships with other women? No. No. Robin would be the first, and hear me out, the first scenario that came to be that... Robin and I had what adults would call an intimate relationship. In other words, um, 
I kissed her, and uh, that was about it. But there was no no sexual intercourse between the two of us. That's in the middle. Just her in a glass of water. Now, where'd you move the glass of water? That's where that was laying right there next to the bed, her side. So she laid in the bed like this, and um, the glass was usually kept right here on her dresser. And they put it laying right on the floor, like right next to the bed. Was there anything else laying there next to it? She usually sleep with a, a heating pad or an electric blanket or anything like this stuff. Um, um, she stuck with a heating pad sometimes. Um, is there any possibility that that wasn't water that was there on the floor, maybe alcohol instead? I wouldn't have the foggiest idea. No idea. Um, well, based on it was a big wet spot, that's all I can tell you. When I stepped in it, when I stepped in it, um, that night it was cold so I just assumed it was a glass ice water. There's no ice there but I just assumed it was glass ice water. Um, well one of the things that you had told me as well as other people was the this fact of her taking alcohol with her dessert. <laughs> There's absolutely no alcohol in her system. I think that's possible because I mixed that right I watched her four minutes of alcohol little glass and pour it in there. So I know that in the body of that glass, well, it tapers down quite a bit when I mean there was at least that much room in the bottom of the damn thing, along then with the blueberries, and then she brought the ice cream up with the ice cream there. Did you say at one time there was three shots? Pretty sure that's what I called it, three shots. That's what it looked like. Because it was most of the time, I think, when they fill those glass bottles, they fill them up on the neck. And this was down below what I call the shoulders of the bottle. What kind of glass or bottle is this? It's a um, round, round bottle, about that big around. Uh, no, that she was drinking out. Or oh, she, drinking out. she fill up. Did she fill up a shot glass or a tumbler? No, just a regular tumbler, the same one I used to always use. Well, I used for my water or whatever. So, you ever been to the bar? Yeah. Okay, you know those They're whiskey great. tumblers? That's what you call it. They're like all that tall? No, not even that tall. It's like about this tall and about that big around. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and that's what she had her ice cream in? No. What she had her ice cream drinking? That was a tall version of that same style of glass that stands about it. Probably, I think it was like, what is that, 10 inches tall? The 8 I guess inches tall? Something like that. It tapers down. I think it's the same kind of like liquor. So like she bottle. poured liquor in the little one, poured it into the big one. Yep. And then you put the blueberries and ice cream in black. I put the blueberries in there. She pulled the ice cream out, put a scoop of ice cream in there, and then I took the LeBron, LeBron hand blender to it. And then she brought the, went back in the bedroom and come back out with the pill crusher. Dumped that in there. And, uh, was that an unusual circumstance for you to help her make her drink? She usually do that on her own. Most of the time she did it herself. When it was her, uh, when she was pouring out of her, Mike's lemonade. She used to just take the Mike's lemonade. She'd pour, she'd pour Mike's lemonade in there, put a scoop of ice cream in it. Why do you suppose she had you help her that night? Because I was in the kitchen and there were blueberries in there, and I'm the one that used the hand blender. She doesn't use the hand blender. Mm -hmm. and she always makes a mess. I'm used all the cook in the house, so it's using the hand blender is pretty easy for me. She finished her entire dessert. I assume so. I didn't see a glass. I said I never saw a glass in the bedroom with the blueberries in it. So um, if she went into the bathroom and grabs her medications, and she would have actually sprinkled that on top of a completely already fixed dessert? Well, that night she just brought it out and we blended it in with the blueberries. Most of the time she'd just bring it out. She'd take her mics and, and go get her pills. And then, I don't know, I, I assume she'd take it back to the bedroom or bathroom or bedroom and put it on top, then bring out and sit and look. She used to sit in her recliner. She got one of those power recliners. That was the only way she could get back up pretty easy is with that power recliner. You've already explored this about as much as I need to, but just to make sure. This is a photo of 
That's um, Rita. That's Rita. Mm-hmm. And Rita is who? Rita used to be my buddy Rob. He's he got caught in a bad repo in Seattle, so he's now in the all along. That was his. Uh, we used to call her his, his girl Friday because every day, every Friday, he seemed to show up with another girl. In 2011, she lost her husband. My friend, whatever he was. And within a, about a month, I guess it was about a month, very close to a month after Peggy passed, um, she called one day. I don't know how I was doing. And thought I was doing okay. I was getting through. I said, What are you doing Friday? Same old, same old. Sit here at the house. No. She says, make sure your motorcycle's gassed up. We're going for a ride. So she came out that Friday. And I was going to ask you what the Friday was. I have no idea. So we went for a motorcycle ride. And uh, come back. And I felt pretty good at the end of the day. I mean, it was nice to get out of the house and get away. That would have that would have been before the memorial, though, because you wrecked your bike on the memorial. Yeah, so it was before the memorial. When was she sending you pictures like that? She never sent me that picture. Well, how'd she get that picture? Hell, if I know, I'm going to remember you get that picture. Maybe she did. I don't know. I don't know. Um, well, that would be in your pictures. Okay. Uh, lost my train of thought there. As far as... Um, Um, as far as uh, hanging out with her, um, is she the, the regular at this point? Who? Rita. No. Oh, okay. But no, I haven't talked to Rita. I think she's messaged me once or twice, just kind of checking in type thing. Oh, I know what I was going to ask you. So uh, what's the situation with you and James since you got in the argument at the... I haven't talked to him. I haven't talked I called. I tried to send him a message to find out, you know, what his deal was. His buddy Dave said, well, it has something to do with Rita. So we only assumed that it was because Rita was there with me that day at the memorial. And he assumed that because she was hanging out, we were sleeping together. Couldn't have been for other than the funny truth. They went to dinner once. They went to dinner. They went to dinner here dave breaks out of the fake rapport he was attempting to build with the detectives a proper response would have been a polite laugh or an explanation as to why pictures of women in dresses differ fundamentally from pictures of horses however dave opts for a rather unintentionally humorous response that can be interpreted as sorry that you don't have friends sending you pictures of horses In any case, this response and its speed elucidates Dave's narcissistic habit of insisting on a lie despite the facts. Dave is in full believe me because I said it mode, and the detectives know that there's not much more slack in Dave with which to work. The interrogation is nearing an end, and now the only real choice is to turn up the heat by focusing specifically on the poor treatment Peggy received from Dave during the course of their marriage. She's just a friend. Why is she sending her full-length selfies of herself? Because she knows I like long dresses. I like horses, but people won't send me pictures of horses. I'm sorry, I don't know what to tell you. That's all there was. Picture her in a sundress. She sent me pictures of beer, too. Uh, beer. People don't send me pictures of beer. I wish they would. Well, she does, um, I don't know, there's some base beer things here in Spokane. Been here a couple of times, and she's uh, volunteered on there. She serves. And I think that was before she goes, before she went, that was a picture of what she was going to be wearing down there. She's a beer connoisseur, I guess you'd call it. You know, um, as we've gone through this, and we've sat here this, this entire afternoon, um, you've discussed how you felt about Peggy. How do you think Peggy felt about you? 
I assume that if she's named to me for 35 years, she must have thought pretty highly of me, I would think. Um, in terms of what she would have said to people, or how do you think other people would have viewed your relationship? I would have been pretty good. So it would surprise you to say other people felt like maybe you kind of treated Peggy poorly? Uh, yeah, it would. Or that you expected her to work all the time and do everything for you? With that kind of yeah, thing. that would really surprise me a lot. Okay. Why do you think somebody would say something like that? I have no idea. Somebody maybe that wasn't at the house every day. I have no idea. Well, a few people have made somewhat similar comments to that effect that didn't feel like you and Peggy actually did have the best relationship as you described. Uh, okay. Okay. Um, so, I feel the same way as Detective Keezer has said, is that, you know, just things don't look right, your responses aren't quite right, or your responses are not appropriate in some, in some aspects. People from the outside don't see you and Peggy as having the best of relationships. Um, they see you as being somewhat controlling, even to the point of um, demanding of her. So, have you talked to my daughter, Elizabeth, about this? Have I talked? I talked with her. Um, I don't know that she has the same opinion, as, yeah. but I'm telling you that some people do. Well, the only opinions I really care about are the people that are there every single day. Okay. Okay. If somebody sees or thinks they see something one day and that's and they draw from that, I I don't care. Okay. I can tell you for a fact that in thirty five years with my wife I never raised my hand at my wife, I never raised my voice at my wife, I never used vulgarity towards my wife. Okay. Okay. Now if somebody thinks or accuses me of something like that on the outside of that, I don't care. Okay. My daughter knows my kids were raised there. My kids know I never raised my hand to my wife. I never verbally abused my wife or anything like that. Our relationship was pretty well 50-50. Um, I took care of everything outside. She took care of most everything inside. When it was raining and pouring outside and I couldn't be outside, I helped her with things inside. We did painting together. We did tile together. So if somebody out there says, oh, no, he was controlling, well, the only person that ever accused her of that, and she hadn't talked to her for almost a year after that, was her sister. Okay. Well, I can tell you that this statement isn't coming from the sister, but what I guess I'm concerned about is looking at this from a different perspective than Detective Keezer. I mean, like you said, he very well could be right that, what happened between you and Peggy is either some kind of a pact or something to that effect that you are a very caring husband and you don't want to see your wife suffering. The other side of that coin is someone who's controlling, wants to have their life, saw some other glimmer of hope off in the distance when he went to see his um, old flame and that kind of thing and came up with some kind of a horrendous plan to get rid of his wife. Which one of those do you want to be? Yeah. Well, sure as hell isn't the latter of the two. And we never came up with a pact. I mean, we talked about that shit, but it never, there was never a, a sit down moment and say, this is what we're going to do. There was no plan of any kind. Um, I mean, it's not that I don't suspect it, but I can't, I won't say, I can't say. So you can't say that, and and you don't want to accept any responsibility in in her death. There is no responsibility of mine. I mean, yeah, I'm okay. It bothered the hell out of me for the first month or so. I bugged the shit out of myself. You know, did I call this too soon? Should I let him do CPR more than 40 minutes? You know, was it my fault because I knew she was taking hydros and I didn't step in and say something? Yeah, I beat the fuck out of myself over that for a long time, and it still bothers the hell out of me. But when I sit back and I look at this, 
you know, and I started thinking, you know, is it possible? You know, did she really choke on water or could she have done this? You know, until you said she had 10 times the amount in her system, I would have never said, yeah, I think she did this herself. I, I could have never. Now, it, I guess the reality's there. Well, like we already discussed, I mean, Robin seemed to somewhat blame you or think is cussing you out, saying, why aren't you paying attention to her? Why aren't you seeing this? She's putting it out there that you're somehow responsible for this. Yeah, she and called me an enabler twice. And then on top of that, when I talked with her by phone, she indicates that, yeah, she had her suspicions. I mean, even your daughter Elizabeth has had her suspicions that you had something to do with this. Really? Really. Well, that kind of surprised me because she never, she never even asked the questions of, you said David did. Because he hasn't talked me in a little bit, so I would understand what if David had, but I can imagine Elizabeth did. Well, there are so many red flags that everyone has had that thought that I have talked with. There's been anyone that we've talked to, friends or family, that hasn't said, yeah, this doesn't look right. I think he killed her. Your daughter wants to take your side, I can tell you that. Elizabeth wants to take your side, but she's having a hard time with it. Because there are so many red flags, dude, that says something ain't right. And you know, the kind of where there's smoke, there's fire. Yeah. Where there's yeah. 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 I, um, until we started cleaning, I would have never thought. But I mean, it's, um, there's a lot of goddamn sleepy stuff around. There shouldn't be that much around. Well, perhaps there shouldn't, but the two things I can tell you is that sleepies didn't kill her, and choking on water didn't kill her. She didn't aspirate on water. Where would the water come from? Well, could have been just like you said, maybe perhaps she was trying to get a drink, but that isn't what killed her. She had too high of an amount of hydrocodone in her system. Basically, it's a drug overdose that kills her. The question is, is how does that drug overdose get there? And with all of your activities, between going and seeing Robin and helping take out the life insurance policy and um, the, the discussions on the internet and that kind of thing, all of the red flags kind of lead your direction. Brings me back to being either the enabler or the guy that did it. And I'm telling you, I never mixed her pills. Never. We had mixed her drink, but I never mixed her pills. She, she took care of my pills. I mean, that's what she did forever. Because um, I always forget to take my damn pills when so she always took care of all my pills. She always put them in a pill box, made sure they were filled all the time. Did the same thing for herself. She was back in the motorcycle gang when she would live. She was the pharmacist. She, that's what she did. That's what she said. I'll be the pharmacist here at the house. I'll make sure that this gets done. I'll make sure that prescriptions get filled. And well, that's what she'd done, but I cannot get my head around the, even the, the slightest thought that she would have actually followed through. I just can't. Well, I don't know. It kind of leaves us at a standstill. I guess if you start pulling away the pieces of the paper and you're left with one thing. So if you didn't kill her and somebody else didn't kill her, pills got in there, so the only, in the end, it's like, okay, either a, you guys had a deal that she was going to do this, or she did it on her own. We didn't have a deal. I don't know that I could have, much as I love her, I don't, honestly, I, I don't think I could have, I 
couldn't have sat back and not went like that. Pain or no pain. I just... How long have you been a member of MTFU? I don't know. A year? Oh, probably at least. Maybe longer. Because I was on there for a while and then um, and then uh, I got kept getting these notices all the time. Even when I hopped out, I kept getting all the notices. So I was off for about a month and then I got back in. What's wrong with it? No, just curious. Oh. Any stories you told the guys at MTFU that might not match the stories that we know? I doubt it. The group's been great. One guy that's a suicide counselor has been calling me every day, or every other day. Is that Cy? Me? That's Cy? That's Cy. Is that Cy? The guy's name is Cy. No, it's uh, Andy Dickerson. Right oh, no. And Randy Dickerson. He works at uh, Remember where insurance auto office used to be? Air Yeah. Where is the building? Mm -hmm. Right next door. Patterson? Peterson? Pe Pearson. Pearson. Pearson? I think it's a Pearson. Yeah. Yeah. He's a machinist in there. Mm -hmm. No. No. Okay. Um, I'm going to take your phone. I'm going to step out here and talk to Detective Keys. Just a second. Okay, um, so we've only got one last thing here, um, Bishop. Uh, we've already talked about several times in here. Uh, in order to get these warrants, I've run it past the prosecutor, I've uh, run it past judges and such. And all the red flags are so many and so pointing at you that I've come to really no other conclusion. Unless you got something else to tell me. Um, I've got a warrant for your arrest for first degree murder. You're going to be booked into the Spokane County Jail. For first degree murder of your wife. If there's anything to tell us, now's the time, my friend. Yeah. Dude, I don't know what to tell you. Okay. Honestly, about what am I supposed to tell you? I don't, we never had a pack. We never had a pack. Okay. Um, if she did, it was all on her own. Well, I, I, at this point, there isn't anyone out there, including your daughter, that believes that she killed herself. And all the red flags, like I said, are pointing in your direction. So um, there's no reasonable way that I can explain this any further. Um, like I said, if you've got some explanation for me that I haven't heard as of yet, then now's the time to lay it on the table. And if not, then you need to go next door. I don't know what to tell you. I, um, go ahead. I don't know what to tell you. I, I, just, I don't know. I, I, well, like Detective Keezer pointed out, I mean, I've been doing this for 30 years. 
He's been doing this for 25. Together, we've got a fair amount of experience. It isn't the first kind of situation like this that we've seen. Um, where there's smoke, there's fires, kind of where I go back to, all the red flags are pointing towards you. There isn't anyone in the family that doesn't think that this is suspicious or hinky. Um, I've run all of my facts past the prosecutor, a judge. They all agree that, yeah, this doesn't look right. And you yourself have admitted, this doesn't look right. This doesn't smell right. And they not only said that it doesn't look right, they said there's probable cause to arrest right. him for murder in the first degree. So the judge said that. Which the different, which first degree? That you premeditated. You started thinking Planned. like this all the way back, probably in November, um, and started planning it out because it took a while to get the life insurance policies lined up and all of the various things that had to happen. So, so this that. isn't a matter of just one day snapping because all of a sudden you found your wife in a torrent affair or something like that. This is the fact that you spent a significant amount of time planning this situation out, thinking about how you could carry it out, trying to avoid detection, make sure that you're not being caught, doing all of these things leading up to the very day of waiting just a couple of days after her life insurance policy becomes effective and then putting what? medication into her. Okay, so when we did the life insurance policy, everybody said right up front, if anything happens within two years, I mean, why in the hell would a guy, if, you're, if they're going to fight it within two years, where the hell does the life insurance even play into this? Well, you were initially, when she passed away, trying to push for the toxicology report and such because you specifically told those people, I need this right away in order to claim the life insurance. So you obviously I, no, have, no, 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 no. Where does that come from? That's exactly what they recorded conversations, too. When you call life insurance, they're recorded. No, no, I'm not talking about the life insurance. When I talk to the uh, medical examiner and the right. state talks about I said, I can't bury her. I can't get the insurance to bury her. I didn't say anything about life insurance. Well, I believe that you did actually say something about life insurance, especially when you called the Washington State Patrol uh, Toxicology Lab and spoke with Kim over there. Mm-hmm. You had multiple conversations oh, with yeah. her, and one of those conversations centered around the very fact that this toxicology had to be done in order to get the final autopsy report in for order to, 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 to the life insurance. Right, but it wasn't for the life insurance, it was to bury her. We didn't have the money to bury her. While Dave is stating that he was rushing the state's post-mortem paperwork process for the sake of obtaining money to bury Peggy, a follow-up with the funeral home shows that the balance was actually fully paid off by Dave shortly after her death. You can go online and get a... Um, go fund me page in order to get the funds to, to take care of her. That's what I was worried about. This is where we're at, David. Dude, I'm telling you, I did not kill my wife. I don't know how, I don't know, I have no way of, I have no way of, of I have no way of, I mean, it's. That's why I presented to you that there were two options. One is first degree premeditated murder, the highest level of murder in Washington state the one with the longest penalty, the one that's got the most aggravators, and then the one that's much below that, which is some other situation. I believe that you were involved. I don't know the exact circumstances. The circumstances point to first degree premeditated. If there's some other circumstances that were involved in her death and you involved, then you need to come clean or you're facing, for, well, you already are first, facing first degree murder. Well, that's it. We're, we're pretty much done talking unless you have an explanation other than that. I don't, even, I don't even know where to go. I, had, I don't know. I didn't kill my wife. Um, you know, the, I, I didn't. I'm telling you, I did not kill my wife. I sus, suspect. Let me tell you a little something about conjunctions. Okay. okay. What's a conjunction? It's a proven fact during high intensity interrogation, that when we say things like, I did not, instead of I didn't, that it follows a lie, okay? There are so many things I can point out about what you're doing that are wrong, and that, and that science backs up. Dude, there's something more here. I don't care, you can sit there all day long and talk to me. 
but I do this for a living, and I risk my life, and I have for 25 years. I've sat across from murderous bastards for the last 10 years, people with multiple murders behind their belt. I'm good at what I do, and he's better than I am. You're not going to convince me you weren't involved. The question is, is what level of your involvement? That's all I want to know, so I know the truth. If you're not supposed to be charged with first-degree murder, and it's supposed to be manslaughter, or manslaughter 2, or murder 2, then I need to do my job and give you the fair option. I'm giving you that option, and that's it. That's all I'm required to do, is give you that option and tell me the truth. So what do you want me to do? Is I want you to tell me the truth. Oh, that's it. And, and, if I, and if I need to adjust that affidavit, or you need to adjust that affidavit, then we need to adjust that affidavit. My job is to be fair and impartial. Okay? If there's something else you want to tell me that would mitigate that first-degree murder, then you need to tell me now. Because when you walk out of that jail and go over the jail, that opportunity's gone. You're sitting in front of the only two dudes right now who can adjust that affidavit. So if there's something more to the story, you need to be telling us now. Later's not going to work. So the fact that we talked about it, but it still comes down to the fact I don't, there's no... The fact that you talked about what? About her being tired of being sore and being about her tired and not sleeping and not getting more than hours worth of sleep and it hurts too much to walk and she's tired of I'm not going to beat her on the bush anymore. Did she help her get rid of that pain? I knew she might have wanted to get rid of that. And I'm not going to beat around that bush. Did you help her get rid of that pain? No. No, you didn't? No. Okay, okay. there we are. Let's be up. I did not... All right, staff turn up, change my back, and arrest first three minutes. Where's the car part? Uh, on the street. You know, give me your cuffs, too. I don't want to yeah. take your shoulders. Um, um, I can call your son or somebody like that so it doesn't get towed. My daughter, Randy. Your daughter, Randy? Oh, out at the house? Yeah. Okay. Um, she's in that phone. Does she... Uh, there's a spare key. There's probably a key in my pocket here. Where's the spare key? Uh, hanging in the love's pantry. I want to get you a bag. Change the pantry. Yeah, sure, Jim. Take your hand off I'll get your bag. Sure. Sure. So knowing that she might have doesn't really... I mean, I can't promise. I can't say. No. I, uh, I can't say. I don't know. Okay. Well, it's, uh, we've come as far as we can. I know. All right. Uh... Actually, go ahead and turn around and face that all. Yep, I'm split the link. All right. Molly you on the jail. Molly, can you call? Call He should be in that pocket. Yeah. This is pretty far? Yeah. What kind of car is it? 2015 Chevy Group. Would you like us to hold that key and call somebody and release that key to them? Because if we put it on your jail property, it's going to be harder for them to get that key. Or is there another piece? Uh, there's no one to stand for you, but that check needs to go out. That's my truck payment. That needs to go out today or now. That Randy can take care of that. Randy can take care of it? Yeah. All right. Uh, so you want that key and the check to go to Randy? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, I tell you, just so we're clear, it's quarter after three right now. We'll try to call Randy and get these things released to her. If I can't get a hold of her, um, I'm probably going to call whoever I can get in touch with that is a relative of you. So that might be your son, uh, Tanya. Maybe even Melissa, because she could get this to Randy. Is that fine with you? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Would you click this? Yeah, I'll close these on your desk. Do you want this with him or on your desk? Uh, with him. Okay. So we'll go to you. I'll watch this over on your desk. All right. So, all right. So now, how do I get a lawyer to get this figured out? What will happen is, um, since this is a warrant there is a bond although it's extremely high on this uh of a million dollars at the most Jesus Christ. so uh, if you had a bondsman and a way to raise the amount of money to you you could bond out on this right away give a time announcement and i'll start off yeah it is
Dave Pettis was sentenced to 25 years in prison for the murder of his wife, Peggy Pettis. He will be 85 when he is released from prison.